I've compiled a bunch of awesome woodworking tips and tricks as well as some mistakes you absolutely should avoid in one compilation video. Let's go. Number one on the list is acclimation. What does that mean? It means when you bring the wood into the shop, it needs to sit in the environment. It's gonna be cut and milled in for a while. Now what's recommended is a week or two, but I know for a fact that a lot of times you don't have that much time. 48 hours really is minimum, but there are cases where you're gonna bring it in, you're gonna cut it, you're gonna put your wood project together without it acclimating. Now, we're talking best practices. Now, why would you wanna do that? Number one is it needs to adjust to the humidity as well as the temperature in your shop. I have a climate controlled shop now, but for years I didn't. And so it just had to adjust to whatever the shop was at the time, whether that be hot or cold, etc. So it just depends on if you're having your wood shipped to you from out of state, out of area, or if you're picking it up at your local lumber yard or home store, that's gonna play a part in the process. For instance, if I go to my local store, pick out some lumber and bring it home and use it right away, theoretically it's going to be okay because I'm only a few miles away from that area. We're the same temperature, same humidity, etc. But I do get hardwood shipped in because we can't buy them locally. And those I do absolutely let them sit for a week, two, sometimes months before I actually get to using them. But 48 hours is a good, minimum rule of thumb. Now the reason you want it to acclimate to your environment is because of the humidity change, the temperature change. If you use it right away, there is a chance that that wood is going to bow and bend and split, all that good stuff, bad stuff, when you use it inside a project and that's where things go bad and that's what you're trying to avoid. So letting it acclimate is gonna help. One of the best things I ever bought for this shop and I still use it even with climate control is my dehumidifier. It is a little bit pricey. You can get smaller models, but I chose this one specifically because it will keep the humidity in this shop between 30 and 50% and I can just leave it on 24 seven. I can connect a hose to it, run that outside and it's always running when the humidity gets above whatever you set it at. That has helped the wood movement and the usability of the lumber that I keep in the shop tremendously. I would highly recommend considering one of those, especially if you're in a humid environment. I'll link to one in the description that I have, but feel free to research and find one that works for your shop. Number two on the list is storing lumber directly on the ground or on the concrete if you have a concrete floor. This is a huge no-no. You should avoid this at all costs. Now, it makes sense why you wouldn't store it on the ground, I think, but on concrete, you think you're safe, but you're not. The reason is concrete is porous, so it absorbs the moisture in the air, and moisture is heavier than air, so all the time it's gonna fall and settle on your concrete, whether you see it or not. Then when you put your lumber on the ground or on the concrete, your lumber starts soaking up that, just like a sponge would. Now, lumber is also porous. If you think of straws being stacked together, that's basically the enlarged version of wood because as the grain runs long ways, on your lumber, that's basically straws are running, microscopic straws running all the way up that board. So it's soaking up that wood, that moisture. And what that's gonna do is cause the wood to expand. Then when you get it off the ground and use it, it's going to contract. And then you're gonna start seeing some major problems as far as splitting, bowing, twisting, all the bad things we're trying to avoid. So keep it off the ground, keep it off the concrete. One thing I did before having any storage in the shop for lumber is I would just take some small scrap pieces and stack them on the ground and then lay the boards that I wanted to keep on top of those. That gets them up off the ground, allow, allow some airflow in there, and it prevents that from soaking any moisture off the floor. Number three on the list is avoid storing your lumber in direct sunlight if at all possible. Now, this shop has windows on the garage. There's also a window back here that I blocked years ago with a piece of styrofoam. You may have seen it in some older videos. And the reason I did that was to prevent that sun from coming in because I used to store my lumber right here on the ground. And I didn't want that sunlight directly impacting or directly contacting my lumber because when it does that, you're getting a few things. It's heating the wood up, which causes it to heat and cool, heat and cool, which is gonna cause it to twist and bend. Also, it's gonna dry it out and discolor it and cause it to be a different color than any of the other spots if it sits there long enough. If you store your lumber outside or in a shed or under a shed, be sure to cover that with a tarp or some plastic sheeting or something like that just to keep the direct sun and the elements off of it. Number four on the list is not properly supporting the lumber while it's being stored. Now, when I first started, I 
again, stack the lumber back here behind me on the floor. And I supported that with several pieces of say scrap two before or scrap something and made sure I had several pieces along the way so that it was supported all the way across. So if it was eight or 10 foot long, there may be five or six of those pieces perpendicular to the wood so that it's always supported. What I did was actually take some concrete blocks and put on top of my lumber stack to help weight that down. And that surprisingly kept anything from twisting and bowing as it acclimated to the shop. I highly recommend doing that if you're gonna have lumber just hanging out. The main reason you wanna support the wood or lumber across the length of the board is because if we take, for instance, where we're gonna pretend my workbench is the ground, if you put a support here on the end and then another one here on the other end and then you let that sit for a month, what's gonna happen? Just the natural weight of this board right in the center, it's gonna bow. It's just physics, it's math, whatever you wanna call it, it's just gonna bow. So on boards five, six feet, I would probably go ahead and put another one or two in the middle just to keep everything nice and equally supported all the way across. And another consideration is like my garage floor is extremely unlevel. Over a course of two feet, it may drop two inches in some places. So you have to kind of take that in consideration when you're uh, building your supports for your lumber, if you're stacking those on the ground, be sure to account for that unevenness in your garage floor if it's bad off. Now, one thing to consider is plywood really doesn't apply to most of this stuff as far as moisture is concerned because it doesn't absorb the moisture, expand and contract like regular wood does. It'll absorb moisture, but it won't expand and contract. Now, it does need to be stored flat and or vertically straight up and down because it will bow over time, especially if, it, if the humidity is changing and temperatures change and things like that. But as far as it moving in and out, it doesn't do that. A little over a year ago, I started storing most of my lumber vertically. And the reason I did that was space saving. Now, when you do store it vertically, plywood, MDF, anything like that needs to be as straight up as possible without it causing any chance for it to tip over. And when you use your one buys, two buys, anything like that to store vertically, make sure it's well supported because you don't want it leaning too far against the wall or it will have a tendency to bow. As long as you can keep it fairly straight up and supported, I like to use my plywood to support my one buys and things like that because it keeps a good flat surface. That keeps anything from bowing or twisting. And the same thing goes on the ground. I keep my lumber up off the ground with scrap pieces just to keep it from absorbing any moisture from the concrete. Vertical is probably my favorite way to store lumber. Another way I store lumber and keep it out of the way and keep it nice and flat and straight are lumber racks. I bought this on Amazon myself. I've actually got two of them. I'm gonna install another one soon. This is a great way to support or to store shorter stock. In other words, four or five foot pieces. Most of my hardwoods I store up here. Walnut, maple, several other species. This was extremely easy to install. I mean, all you have to do is make sure you're getting into a stud because it's gonna be supporting weight. So you want to make sure it's nice and secure. I was a little concerned at first that it wasn't gonna be strong enough, but it's been up here for a couple of months now zero issues and as you can see it's stacked full of some really nice hardwood i was also a little concerned with it only having two supports that it would bow or twist or cause the lumber to do that but i have had zero issues with that and it's spaced out perfectly so that four or five foot pieces are supported nicely and they don't twist or bend it's a really nice product from bora and they're very inexpensive so if you're interested i'll link a link in the description for that of course there's also an option to be able to store your lumber on a cart that you can roll around your shop the reason I never opted for that was I just didn't have space for it. Those things are gonna take up quite a bit of space and in a two car garage, I can't lose any more space than I've already lost to essential items like a miter station, a workbench, or even the storage unit behind me. So it just depends on your shop, your needs, on whether a cart would work for you. Another great option is storage shelves. Uh, for years, I used Husky brand shelves and I was able to store my lumber on those shelves. They're nice and flat, they're well supported, and they're up off the ground. This is an excellent way to get your lumber off the ground and have a storage space for it. I used two of them for years and it worked perfect for the shop. I highly recommend those shelves and they're really inexpensive for what you're getting. Super well made and can hold a lot of weight. Number five thing you should always avoid is storing your lumber in a damp or humid place or environment. Now, sometimes that can't be avoided, especially if you live in the South like me, but again, adding a dehumidifier really helped that. Or just keeping the garage door shut will actually help that as well if you're able to. Now, if you're in an area where you can't or you don't have the room to do that or you don't have a space to do that in, storage sheds, things like that will also help. Just try to keep everything up off the ground and covered so that it's not damp or wet. For instance, my local lumber store, Barton's, 
actually stores all of their lumber outside. There is no indoor storage like you see at Home Depot or Lowe's, but it is covered. And for the most part, it stays fairly dry. Now, if it's really pouring down rain, I try to avoid getting lumber from there for a day or two after so it can dry out in that open air. But with it being covered with a light rain, it usually never gets wet. Of course, it is stored outdoors, so it's gonna pick up some of that moisture from the outside air, especially when it's raining or damp. That's one of the reasons why we revert back to number one. We let it acclimate. So if you pick up the lumber from the lumber store and it's damp, it's wet, it's been raining, bring it to your shop, let it sit for a week, if at all possible, two weeks. If not, minimum 48 hours, let it acclimate to the temperature and humidity in your shop. You know what time it is, power tip time. The reason we go through all of this trouble is to try to minimize wood movement. In other words, the bowing, the twisting, the splitting, anything that's going to damage your project later, that's what we're trying to avoid by storing this properly and keeping it as dry as possible. With that said, don't be overly concerned with wood movement. It's in my experience in the last six years of building things out of construction grade pine, building things out of hardwood, basically anything furniture wise end tables dining tables tabletops breadboard ends i've had very very minimal movement in any of that and when i say minimal during certain times of the year you can feel maybe two boards aren't perfectly lined up like they were when i built it there may be a 64th of an inch that you can feel a little lip there but for the most part it's moving so small so minor of movements over the course of months it's not gonna make that much difference. So don't go overboard with worry and concern about wood movement. The main thing we're looking for when we bring lumber into the shop is to keep it from bowing, moving, and twisting before you use it. Once you make your project with it, 99% of the time, it's going to be fine. I made this little end table several years ago, and this is construction grade lumber that I bought at my local lumber store. It's pine. I bought it, brought it home, and made it probably the same day or within a few days of buying it. So wood movement was never a concern, number one, because this is such a small piece. Even on some of my end tables that we built or over the years, I would buy the lumber that week and buy and build with it. So wood movement is something that you think about, but don't not build just because you're worried about it. It'll be fine. First thing you should do is remove any oversized or loose fitting clothing, especially that has sleeves, or if you're wearing a hoodie that has those strings, those things gotta come off if you're gonna be around spinning blades. I've seen some very gnarly accidents, especially at a miter saw because of a loose fitting sleeve. Same thing goes with the table saw. Or if you wear bracelets, I, I like wearing bracelets, but I try to take those off, or I do take those off if I'm gonna be working around these spinning blades. It's just not worth the risk. After you make sure you don't have any loose fitting clothing, what you need to do is set up the table saw correctly so that it's going to cut straight and accurate because if you don't, it can cause some kickback issues and other things. So what I like to do is make sure that the slot, these slots on your table saw, no matter if you have one or two, just make sure that the one of the slots is aligned with that blade. And I just use a combination square and you can see here, I just make sure that the, it touches exactly the same or has the exact same gap all the way across. It's not rocket science, but as long as that right there looks perfectly, well, I say perfect, as long as that looks really, really close, that means this blade is square to the slot. Next thing you need to do is make sure that this fence is also aligned to the slots. If they're not, there should be some adjustments you can make to your table saw to adjust the table to the blade. Almost all saws have it. You'll have to check your manual or just Google the manual online and find it at the manufacturer's website. But you wanna make sure those two things are lined up. And if you're making 90 degree cuts, ensure that this blade is actually 90 degrees because a lot of times, even if the indicator over there shows it's on zero, that doesn't mean it's actually at zero. Just double check that, make sure everything's lined up, then you can start making your cuts. Next thing you wanna do is make sure that you set this blade correctly. You don't want that blade sticking way up. There's no reason for it to be well past the wood. About, I don't know, an eight, three eighths of an inch max over the blade. Typically you want those gullets or the cutouts of that blade to be right at or just above the piece. That helps clear the wood out and stuff. But you, there's no reason to have it an inch, two, three inches above it. All that does is introduce more chance for your hand to contact that blade. And I would much rather, if an accident's gonna happen, I would much rather the blade just be barely sticking above the wood and it cut into me versus an inch and a half above where it cuts off 
parts. Like we don't want that. So just make sure you set that blade height correctly. And speaking of blades, you want to make sure that your blades are sharp. If you're using dull blades and you're having a whole lot of trouble pushing that wood through, you're going to cause yourself more trouble. Because if it's having trouble cutting the wood, it's more likely you're gonna wind up with A, bad cuts, and also it's gonna be binding and not wanting to cut. It's more chance for kickback, so a good blade is key. Next up, all modern table saws have riving knives. In other words, that piece of metal that's right behind the blade, that needs to be there at a minimum. Have that on there. That prevents the wood from pinching after it gets cut. Pinching wood is bad, it's gonna be a kickback or a very high chance of a kickback, and we're trying to avoid that at all costs. So make sure you have your riving knife installed. Well, all table saws you buy today will also have a blade guard. If it's possible to use the blade guard, it's highly recommended to use it. I am as guilty as anyone, full disclosure, of not having my blade guard on. I have no excuse. The blade guard should be there if you're using your table saw. There's times when you can't use it. If you're using a crosscut sled or some other things, the blade guard also has a riving knife built in, so you don't have to worry about, you know, if the riving knife is there. So it's already there, plus there's a guard over the top of the blade that will just help you keep your hands away from the blade should an accident happen. Also, a lot of your blade guards have anti-kickback paws, and they're just these little spring-loaded arms. They, they have little teeth on them, and what that's going to do is if that board tries to go back that way, those teeth will dig in and pre help prevent that kickback. So it's a good idea to have the blade guard if you can. Next, you want to avoid bowed and or twisted wood when you're trying to cut it on the table saw. It needs to be flat. In other words, it's not twisting or bowed up on the table saw like you see here, this piece of walnut's rocking back and forth. That's gonna cause some major issues if you try to cut that because what's gonna happen is you're gonna start out and it's gonna be like, say high on the top left side where the blade is contacting it. When you push it through and it twists the other way, that's puts too much pressure on the blade and the, between the woods, just causes a kickback. That's what's gonna happen. You're gonna have a bad kickback there. So you need to try to make sure they're all flat, properly milled. And with that, bowed lumber like this two before here, if you're pushing it through and it's touching the fence on the back side and then on the front side, it's bowing out, bad news. <laughs> Another kickback opportunity there. Same thing as if it's the opposite way. You just wanna make sure that you don't try to cut a straight line on bowed wood. It just doesn't work. One way to joint those boards, I've got a jointing jig video I'll drop in the description, but you can rip one edge of that with the jointing jig like this. It works really well. You get one flat side, then you can use the flat side against the fence and you're good to go for edge jointing. Next thing you wanna do is make sure you start your cut off correctly. For one, you never ever make a free-handed cut without the fence. Just don't, no, <laughs> no, you're not allowed to do that. You do not do that. Now, what you wanna do is set the fence properly, whatever thickness you want to cut this board, it's called a rip cut, you're gonna rip that, that width, whatever you got the fence set at. Make sure it is laying flat on your table saw when it contacts the blade. Also make sure that you're not starting crooked either to the left or to the right of the fence. It needs to be flat against the fence, flat against the table, then make the cut. No other way, don't do it any other way. It's just safe way to do it. Now since we're making the cut, you wanna be aware of where you're standing. You never, ever, ever, ever stand directly between the blade and the fence in this line because that's where the kickback's going to happen if it's going to happen, the, the width of this board. So if you're cutting this board and kickback does happen, you need to be to the left, to the left. Stand to the left. Come on! Stand to the left of the blade, push it through. You can stand to the right of the blade, but then you can't really see what's going on because the fence is kind of in the way and you can't keep an eye on and make sure that that board's flat against the fence. You want to make absolutely sure you're on the left and push it through and if kickback happens, it flies past you and not into you. I actually had a very bad kickback happen to me that uh, could have been worse than it was. So I had a very old table saw, it's called a, like a Delta Shopmaster. The fence didn't square to the blade. Remember tip number one or two there? It wasn't square to the blade and I was trying to cut a piece of crooked two before what happened was it bound up and kicked back and it hit me right on the hip bone on the right side and caused a massive bruise. Not only that, it hurt like crazy. Uh, so that was the major, most major kickback I've ever had. And that made me very aware of how fast that can happen and there's nothing you can do about it when it happens. So just be cautious of that. Make sure you're standing off to the side so if it does kick back, it doesn't hit you or anyone behind you. Now, when you start cutting the wood, you're gonna need a push stick, but you don't necessarily start with a push stick if the board's long enough. And let me show you. Take this board. This is only about maybe 18 inch board. 
if I start to cut with this board and I use the push stick too early, it literally just makes it kick up on the front. If that blade is spinning, this, this ain't good. This ain't good at all because if it gets too much, it's going to throw it back. So you make sure what I do is I'll keep my hand back here on this table. I'll push it until we get to where the leverage is on the table or most of the board is on the table. Then I'll grab the push stick and then we'll push. And there is a better place to put this push stick. You don't want to be over here by the fence on wider boards because what that does, it actually works, again, leverage. When you're pushing on this corner, it's going to cause it to kick out at the top, even if slightly. So what you want to make sure you're doing is I like to push closer to the blade here, not at the blade, but more to the left or left of center, I guess you would say. And that's going to push most of the pressure will be pushing up against that fence. Then you can make your cut safely. This is where I think a lot of people get in serious trouble with the table saw. And this is where a lot of injuries happen that I've seen with videos and what people have told me. When you're making your cut, you've already established how you're pushing it with a push stick and you get to this point. The cut is done, right? You're through the wood, you've made your cut. Two things that people do that cause the injuries with table saws. One, they reach and grab the off cut piece that on the left side of the blade. There's really no need to do that. If it's there, you can use the push stick to reach around and push it to the left push, or push it on through, get it out of the way, or turn the table saw off and then touch it. But a lot of people reach and grab that off cut. The second thing people do is if they don't have any outfeed support on the back, you see this board is just gonna fall over. And most people don't want that board to fall over because it's gonna get damaged. Like that. So what a lot of people do, a lot, I've seen it in tons and tons of videos on YouTube that with injuries and without injuries, but they'll reach across the blade and grab that board and pick it up. This is a recipe for disaster. For one, if, if you don't pick it up correctly, it can kick back, but also your hand is so close to that blade. Your wrist is so close to that blade. You don't want to cut this wrist in that direction with that blade. Bad news. If it cuts deep enough and cuts at the right spot, about 90 seconds, you're going to black out. And if nobody finds you, about three minutes, you're not going to be with us no more. So it's a very serious, and we'll talk about that more later in the safety equipment. But make sure you don't reach around or across over top of that blade. It's just bad news. Now, it's talking about reaching over the blade there's, and keeping that piece from falling off, that's why you see so many people with outfeed tables behind their table saw, me included. I have mine slightly lower than my table saw top so that when I do make that cut and I do get to the point to where it's going to tip over, it'll just land on the table. And that's what the outfeed table is for. Now, not everybody has space for an outfeed table. I have a tool that I'm gonna show you later that will help you fix that too. Uh, so you, if you don't have space for an outfeed table or if you don't have the budget right now for one or anything like that, but outfeed tables are great. You can get roller stands, fairly cheap, like $20 for a roller stand. And that'll help a little bit, keep, especially if you've got it spaced just right. But outfeed tables or some type of outfeed support will keep you from having to reach over that and care about that board. You're just gonna push through the cut, don't worry about it. Next thing I highly recommend, strongly recommend, if your table saw has it available, some manufacturers like SawStop have them available. And some you can buy third party on Amazon, Etsy, et cetera, or zero clearance inserts. I actually bought some from my old Delta table saw uh, on Etsy made out of MDF. Uh, so a lot of people were making these for third parties. But what that does is it keeps the small pieces, like if you're ripping thin strips and things, from getting jammed down in between the blade or falling down in there. And it's gonna make a cleaner cut on your table saw. And I think they make them much safer as well because it's not letting that small piece fall down in there and then become a projectile when it gets caught by the blade. So I really recommend zero clearance if there's available for your table saw. So just search on Etsy and or Amazon or any other manufacturer's website and see if they have them available. I have seen this cut on YouTube more times than I can count. And it makes me so nervous and almost like, oh, it's just, it makes my anxiety go sky high when I see it. I see a lot of people making smaller cuts, thinner cuts like this and they'll, they'll have their hand on the fence and then they'll push the board by right here. Even if it's only a couple of inches, man, it makes me so nervous because there's no reason to do that. There's too many other options here. One, you can use a push stick, which is optimal. If the cut is too thin, 
and you can't get a push stick in there, then you shouldn't be cutting it against the fence like that. There's a better option when we get into the tools you can use. I'll show you that, but don't, absolutely don't use your fingers here. I don't like seeing if it's three or four inches wide and you're making this cut with your hand on the fence. It's just, too, it's just not worth it. There's too much opportunity and chance you're gonna get a kickback. And if it kicks back, it's highly likely it's just gonna pull your hand towards the blade. And if your hand hits the blade and you don't have the safety technology, bad news. It's gonna be a bad day. It's gonna be bad months if it cuts in your hand. If you're trying to make thin cuts like this, against between, there's only like a half inch between the blade and the fence. There's no way to push that through safely. Yeah, you can use the gripper. I like it, we'll talk about it later. But the better option is to flip it around and cut that off cut on the left side of the blade using something like this thin rip jig. I really like this jig. It's very inexpensive and you can make repeatable cuts with that thin slices. So if you need an eighth inch every time, it'll just batch those out for you. And then it keeps you from getting things bound up against the fence and you can push the stock through safely. All right, one final tip before I get into the tools I highly recommend you get for a table saw. Uh, the, the, the main tip that I'll t share with you about being safe with a table saw is if it doesn't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. <laughs> I just made that up right then, y'all. <laughs> I did. That, that's gotta be a shirt. That's gotta be, come on. If it don't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. It's just, if you have a gut feeling that that's not gonna work out or that you're feeling a little hinky about it, I've been there. I've also been there and made the cut and caused myself, I broke my thumb trying to cut a tiny piece on a miter saw and I knew I shouldn't do it right before I did it. So just stop, just stop. There's no reason, there's nothing pressing there. It's not a life and death situation if you make this cut. So just stop, back up, rethink, say is there a safer way to do this and then make, and figure it out and make the cut. If it don't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut. All right, now the first tool I think you should get for your table saw that will make things safer and easier on you I think a feather board. Now there's a bunch of different makers of feather boards out there. I've tried a bunch of them. My favorite's the bow feather board. I like them a lot. They have some that have this gray insert, some of the black insert. Doesn't really matter what color it is. They work exactly the same. So all of these fit in a standard T-slot. You tighten them down. And as you notice, whenever I'm pushing those boards through, those little teeth on there, or feathers rather, will bend forward toward the blade. If something bound up and it started to kick back. These lock into place and help prevent kickback. Will they stop at 100%? No, but will they help and slow it down? Absolutely. And another great feature is because it's pushing pressure toward the fence, it keeps the stock against the fence and makes your cuts more accurate. That's what I really like about them. Now, one thing about setting these up, always set a feather board up, a horizontal feather board up before the blade. In other words, you never put it at the blade or behind the blade because then you're just putting pressure on the blade and behind the blade causing pinching, which causes a kickback. So just before the blade is where you use these feather boards horizontally. I think you need to seriously consider getting some push sticks for your table saw. You say, well, my, my table saw come with a push stick. This thing is not a good push stick. I, I made a whole video talking about why. But basically, after, if these things are especially if they're subjected to heat and cold, heat and cold, they get brittle. And if they get brittle and it hits that blade, they can literally shatter. And I've had multiple people on that video comment and say, that happened to me. And when they shatter, sharp pieces of plastic come back and hit your hand. Uh, there's actually a video here that I'll show you that shows what happens. Like it, it, could, it could get serious, it really could. And so I really don't like these, these type of push sticks. I think there's better options available. And these are the three I like. And you don't even have to buy push sticks. You can make your own. There's several different, like you can look around the internet. There's tons of different versions available. This is a popular version. This is a version that my friend makes at All Red Woodworks. And he, he's got free plans available for this. I'll drop a link down there in the description if you want to get those free plans. Very simple to make. This keeps your hand way away from the blade and uh, keeps pressure down on the bottom. It's got a little foot push. It's just a really nice little design. So if you want to check that out and get free plans for this versus buying one, I, I use this quite regularly, but I also love having the regular push stick from Bo as well as the micro jig push block. I think having a good variety is always a good option. Again, I like the bow push sticks. They have a foam insert, so if it gets cut or whatever, as far as a long push stick, this is the ones I use. My favorite push block is the gripper. It's the micro jig gripper. If you've watched YouTube, you've seen these things around. I bought this one years ago, and I use it all the time. I love this thing. It's really good, especially if you have to go over the blade, making some of those shorter cuts like we talked about earlier. It has a little ledge that will drop down so you can get up on this thicker stock and be able to help balance that out. It's just a really good, well-made 
push block, and I've seen a lot of knockoffs, especially recently on the market. I don't recommend those. Just spend the amount of money, whatever this is currently, it, it's worth it, whatever it is. I think this is one of the best push blocks on the market. And again, I'll link to everything I'll talk about in the description. This is my favorite. They have a gripper go too as well. It's uh, basically you don't move anything. Everything's already set. But I actually prefer the gripper, the original, the OG. If you cut a lot of plywood, this thing is awesome. This is the Jessam stock guides. I built this little jig. Uh, actually, my friend over at All Red Woodworks told me about it and sent me the measurements and I made it off of his measurements. You're just using two mag switches. And if you have like a, a saw stop style table saw with this type of fence, it will literally lock into place with these uh, magnets. It has rollers that are angled towards your fence. So it's pushing the stock toward the fence and they only roll one way. So it does help prevent that kickback as well. And they adjust to basically any size stock. You can use this on hardwoods, thicker woods, plywoods, anything like that. It's just a well-made tool. And if you put it on, go ahead and put it on a jig like this, it hangs up out of the way. It's never in your way. Now, if you need that outfeed support and you don't have an outfeed table like we talked about earlier, because you don't want that board falling off the back, you don't want to have to reach over and grab things. One of the best tools I saw in 2023 by far was the bow extender fence. It comes in three sizes. I think the 46 inches still sold out. But the 36 inch is a really good option as well. It keeps the boards from falling off the back because it has outfeed support, or you can use it for ends feed support. And you can also attach feather boards to it for vertical pressure down to keep those boards from popping up. This is a genius, genius level piece of equipment for your saw, and it'll clamp to any of your fences that you already have. So if you have a job site saw, it'll work on that. If you have a cabinet style saw like this one, it'll work on that. So it, it's a very universal saw and you can use it on your band saw as well. So it's kind of a dual purpose fence. It's one of the best innovations of last year. Also, I think if you're cutting a lot of small parts and things like that, and you just need very good accuracy for cross cutting, in other words, cutting across the grain, I think you should build a cross cut sled doesn't matter whose you use. I have one on my channel. I like it because it's mine. It has safer handles and all that stuff. It's really good for cutting small parts and getting very accurate cuts. There's tons of them available on YouTube as well. I'll link to mine in the description, but all you gotta do is search table saw sled on YouTube. You'll see dozens and dozens of videos. Those are absolutely a must have for table saws in my opinion. Now, if you don't have a cross cut sled, a lot of people, especially when I first started, I was very intimidated to try to make one. So I didn't make one for a long time because it, it was just, it would just look like it was an insurmountable mountain that I would never climb. But a good miter gauge is also a great option. And this is the V27 from Incra. It's not that expensive uh, as far as miter gauges go. Some of these things can get up three, $400. This one I think is like 70 or so dollars, give or take. Uh, but you can get good accurate results with this because the ones that come with the table saw are usually trash. Unless you buy Harvey, they, those usually come with a really good one. I'm not associated with Harvey. They have nice miter gauges, but this one is also a really good option. So you can put a faux, a faux fence on there to extend this out if you want to. And then also it's just very accurate and for what it does. So you can get good cross cuts with this if you don't want to build a sled. Speaking of repeatable cuts, as far as cross cut goes, if you have this miter gauge and or any miter gauge, and you're going to need to make two inch cuts here, you're cutting two inch pieces over and over and over and over, whatever the size is, doesn't really matter. A lot of beginners will come over and set their fence on two inches and then they will start making those cuts. The problem is you're going to cause some kickback here because what's going to happen is this piece is going to get bound up in here. You're pushing on this piece. This piece is going to come shooting back. You should never do that. So a better option is you can use anything as a stop block, but these are really good and they're very inexpensive. You use them all the time. They're perfectly square all the way around. So you can use them as a square. It's called a one, two, three setup block. It is exactly one inch thick by three inches tall by two inches wide. Exactly, you can bank on it. It's close to exact as we need in the wood shop. All you have to do is say we're making two inch cuts. We're just gonna move our fence over to four inches. We're gonna move this as our stop block. So when we push this piece of wood up against it, it's gonna stop there. Now I can make my cut. There's free space here. It's not gonna kick back. I can move that out of the way with a push stick, push it on through and then come back with the next cut and make it again. That's two inches every single time or one inch or however you want to put those, but they, they, they're heavy enough. They stay in place. You can also clamp them in place if you wanted to, but they stay in place because they're nice heavy metal. And so it's just a good option to have. As far as keeping yourself safe, your personal self safe at the table saw, there's a few things that a lot of people recommend and one that nobody recommends that I do. First and foremost, safety glasses. 
These are 3M brand safety glasses. I like them because they stretch around my big old noggin and they don't fog up, which is key here in a minute. Also, a lot of people recommend hearing protection. It's always a good idea to have hearing protection of some kind. Just make sure it's like OSHA certified, OSHA approved, et cetera. That way it actually blocks out the right amount of decibels. This is an RZ mask. There's a new M3 model. I have one over in the box. This is the M2 model that I use all the time. M3 is new and improved, it's even better. I just have this one here. They're nice. They fit, they're Velcro back, and they have replaceable filters inside. These are great to keep that fine dust out of your lungs. You should have some of these. Last but certainly not least, I think every, every woodworker should have a tourniquet because like we talked about earlier, I've said this before in videos, if you cut a major artery, you have about 90 seconds-ish, depending on blood flow, before you black out. And then in, within three minutes or so, you, you've bled out and you're gonna not be here with us. And we want you here with us. You matter to us, you matter to me. So get a proper name brand cat tourniquet. Now, I'll link to the ones in the description that I recommend that are like real. There's a bunch of knockoffs out there and the reason you don't want a knockoff is when you put this on and you start tightening it down, if it breaks, you might as well not even bought it because it's what it's forced to cut off the blood circulation. Um, and they always say high or die, put it up as high as you can, tighten it up on the leg, on the arm, never put it around your neck. Uh, it should go without saying, but sometimes you have to say things. And I highly recommend buying two. Why? Well, I have three in here. I have one at the toolbox behind you. I have one at the miter station, one in here, and then I have an extra one, so four that you practice with. You don't wanna practice with the one that you may need because you're, you don't wanna like loosen it up and make it not work right or even put strain on it where it could be damaged and not work or break. So you can buy, I'm not gonna tell you to buy a fake one. <laughs> buy four, three, two, whatever you're gonna do, minimum two, use one to practice with and then use one. I leave mine on the table saw. You may have seen them in the videos. It stays at the table saw. Make sure it's properly staged. Now, how do you put these on? Well. I'm gonna let a professional show you. There's a link in the description below that shows you how to properly do it. I've shared that video several times. That's what you do. You do what he says and then practice, practice, practice. We talking about practice, man. If you're out here bored and you're thinking of a new project or you're trying to think stuff, make sure you're practicing with these because muscle memory will kick in when, a, when an accident happens. The last thing you wanna do is try to figure out how to use it when you need it. You should already know how. When you first start woodworking, it can be extremely confusing on what tools to buy and what brands to go for and what tools you're gonna need for woodworking, especially in power tools. So in this video, I'm gonna go over the first five tools I think you should buy to build the type of projects you may have seen on this channel and other woodworking channels. Let's go. Number one on the list, or 1A, is a drill and driver combo. Now you can buy these in combo kits, which is what I would actually recommend because you'll get a better deal because you're gonna get chargers, batteries, and the drill, plus the impact driver that you're gonna need for woodworking. Now I started with this old set, the Rigid Gen 5X. I bought those in 2017, they're still going strong. Typically, most of these tight tools are gonna to last you a very long time. It really doesn't matter the brand you pick, in all honesty. Now you may prefer a different brand depending on if you already have a battery platform that you're in. And I do recommend getting cordless tools. It makes your life much easier. However, if you are on a budget, you can certainly pick up drills that are corded for much, much less than what you could pick up a cordless set. I have here in front of me three different brands. We've got Milwaukee, Ryobi, and Rigid. I've used all three of these. They're all very nice. It just depends on what you like. It may even come down that you like the green color or the red color, and that's okay if that's what you want. Don't let anybody steer you in any different direction. Just pick the brand you like and go with it. One thing to consider when you're picking out a cordless set though is the tool selection going forward. So if you plan on doing this for a while, you're gonna also wanna pick up some of their other options on cordless tools. So look at the brands and see which one has the type of tools you're gonna want. And that brings me to 1B. I think every woodworker should have a circular saw and the reason I put this in 1B instead of number two is because of the combo kits. You can actually pick up a good combo kit at a good price that includes a circular saw, drill driver, and batteries, charger, all that for a nice price. And if you're looking for deals on these, I have a deals page, 731woodworks.com slash tool dash deals. I'll link that in the description in the pinned comment so you can find it easier if you'll check that daily. I post deals there all the time. 
but a circular saw is actually a necessary tool, especially for beginners if you don't have the other bigger tools that you may upgrade to later. And picking it up in a combo kit is a great way to save money. Classic two bird, one stone scenario. It's your classic two bird, one stone scenario. And speaking of batteries, you'll see a variety of different ones. You'll have 12 volt, you'll have 18 volt, you'll have 20 volt. And really the ones you want to go with, depending on the power and the battery life of each, is up to you. The battery life on these are much less than, say, something like a 5 amp hour DeWalt 20 volt or even the 6 amp, 5 amp, 2 amp, whatever amp hour battery of the 18 volts. They just have a bigger capacity, really, is all you're looking for. And what most people don't know is the 18 and 20 volts are basically the same thing. If you put a voltmeter on these batteries, you're gonna get very similar readings. They just all call them 18 or 20 volts. The amp hours you see may be five, maybe four, maybe two, maybe eight, whatever that is, the higher the number, the higher capacity and the bigger the battery will be. Another thing to consider with the 12 volt is the size of the tools. A lot of times these 12 volt batteries, you're gonna get a much lighter weight tool. So if you really want more convenience, less weight, less bulky tools, 12 volt may be the way to go for you. In most cases, as a beginner, it really doesn't matter which tool you pick. Just pick the ones you like and go with those. You'll be fine for multiple years to come. I'll link some of my favorites in the description below to help give you an idea. One last thing about cordless tools, if your budget allows, be sure and get the brushless line of tools versus brushed tools. What that means is the motors are brushless. And like this Ryobi set has brushed motors, the battery life will be less and they'll have a little bit less power versus the brushless. And you don't have to worry about the brushes wearing out in the brushless motors because there's no brushes. If you don't know what brushes versus brushless are, I'll drop a link in the description below that explains that. Number two on the list, obviously you're gonna to need to sand the wood. Right the circle, left the circle. So a good sander is absolutely necessary for a beginner woodworker. Now there's so many options out there, literally dozens and dozens of sanders to choose from. So how do you know what's best for you and your shop? Well, I will tell you from personal experience, don't go the cheapest route. When I first started, I bought a Hyper Tough from Walmart. Matter of fact, that was the first video on this channel was a Hyper Tough versus a DeWalt. You should go watch that, it's pretty bad. The, the, the Hyper Tough wore out in just a few weeks, so that's why I went and bought a DeWalt. Now, the DeWalt lasted for years and years and years and done really well for me. I still have one DeWalt down here in this cabinet. But there are lots of options out there for under $100, which I'm working on a full review of that now. As far as sandpaper goes, 80, 120, and 220 is typically all you'll ever use for the most projects. Rarely do I ever go up more than 220, and nine times out of 10, I only sand 120 grit for most projects. It's, it's plenty. I do like the 3M Cupitron paper better than the other papers that I've tried, but there are some other good options out there like Tiger Shark, Diablo, and some others. The number three tool I think every beginner should buy is a miter saw. Now I've done some reviews on some budget friendly miter saws like the Win. It's a great pick if you're on a budget. If you have a little bit more money, I highly recommend the DeWalt DWS779. This is a workhorse of a miter saw that will last you for years to come and do you a fine job. It's extremely accurate and it's extremely durable. This is my favorite miter saw that I've ever owned, even above the Festool Capex, because of the price, the quality, and the full features that you get. It's a sliding 12 inch miter saw. You got maximum capacity for cross cuts as well as bevels, angles, anything you're gonna need. It's also extremely accurate. I've never had any accuracy issues with this miter saw. Now, why would you pick a miter saw if you already have a circular saw that you purchased earlier? Well, one thing is repeatable, accurate cuts. So when you're building furniture, or you're building cutting boards or projects and you need that accuracy every single time and without having to try to set up jigs and stops, this is where this will help you. And when you start trying to cut miters, you're gonna want something that you can set to a 45 degree or a 30 or a 20 degree angle and make that cut over and over and over and it'd be the exact same every single time. That's where the miter saw shines and I think most beginner woodworkers should have a miter saw in their shop. Now, can you use a table saw and a jig to replace some of the things that a miter saw can do? Yes, but when you start cutting long boards, it's very difficult to do that on a table saw with any accuracy. So that's why the miter saw is my number three pick for the must have woodworking tool for beginners. 
Number four on the list are routers. I think a router is an essential woodworking tool, especially for beginners. This opens up a whole lot for you. You're gonna be able to make roundovers, chamfers, dress up the edge of those projects, in other words. And they're also gonna allow you to do grooves like dados, dovetails, things like that. So you could build jigs, install T-track, or many other things you can do with a router. You could also do Morse and tenon, use them with templates. Like the options are really endless with a router. You can also put routers in router tables and that opens up a whole nother world or build your own router table for your router. Now, should you pick cordless router or corded router? That's really up to you and what you're gonna be doing. If you're doing mainly edge profiles and not a whole lot of grooves, mortises, anything like that, then a cordless router would do you just fine. I prefer the DeWalt or the Milwaukee if I'm choosing the best router, but the Ryobi does really well also. My pick for the first router you should buy is actually this router. I have a video dedicated just to this router. You can go check it out, but it includes a plunge base and a fixed base. That really opens up a lot of options for you and it's extremely reasonably priced. That's a mouthful for what you're getting. You're getting a two and a quarter horsepower router, which is very powerful. That means you're gonna be able to cut dados without issue, like when I built this workbench and cut these grooves in there in that three quarter inch plywood to put that T-track in, extremely easy. Also, you can use this to do dovetail grooves. It just doesn't bog down as easily as these do if you're trying to cut more material. This is the DW618. It is my favorite router in the shop above all the cordless routers because of how versatile and powerful it is. I will say this, if you're looking at cordless routers and the feel in the hand matters to you, the DeWalt is by far the biggest as far as circumference goes. If you don't have big hands, this will be very uncomfortable to you to hold, where the Ryobi and the Rigid will be much more comfortable for smaller hands. The Milwaukee is kind of the better middle ground. It's kind of not too big, not too little. It's the Goldilocks of routers, as far as feel goes. And it's extremely confusing on what router bits you need to get started because there's so many options out there. But I put a video together for you that's the first five router bits every beginner needs. I'll link that at the end of this video as well as in the description. That way you can go check that out, help you decide if you need those bits for your shop. But if you don't wanna go through that trouble, then Whiteside has a four pack of bits that you can pick up that has a chamfer bit, a round over, and two different flush trim bits that you'll use all the time. Those are probably be my pick for the first bits you should buy. It's about a hundred bucks, so it's a little pricey, but Whiteside are some of the best in the business. Link in the description. Stick around after number five, we got a bonus pick for you you don't wanna miss. Number five, I think every woodworker should have a table saw. Not specifically this table saw, we'll talk about models in just a minute, but a table saw is gonna open up a world of new things for you in your wood shop. Number one, you can rip boards accurately all the way down, which is awesome. You can also build special jigs for these like crosscut sleds, jointing sleds, tapering sleds, all sorts of things that you can do with a table saw. You can also cut dados and grooves and miters and many, many other things that a table saw offers to your wood shop. The reason I say fifth on the list is because all of those other tools will lead up to the table saw. Now there may be some controversy here as some people might pick a planer first. So if you're one of those people, let us know in the comments which one you choose and why. Now, as far as brands and models of table saws go, I would steer clear of the very, very cheap table saws, especially the ones that have fences that you can't set to get square. Specifically, one of the Ryobi table saws I've seen, I don't care for it. Harbor Freight made an older table saw that the fence wouldn't, it didn't have the rack and pinion fence, in other words, this gear driven fence. So it was hard to set square. However, my pick for best table saw for beginners is a skilled table saw that you can pick up on Amazon. I reviewed it a while back. It is an excellent full 10 inch size table saw. This is plenty powerful to cut through anything you want. It's got a, like a 30 something inch rip capacity and it's just an all around good saw for the price. Now, if your space is a concern, this DeWalt is an eight and a quarter blade. It is a really good, powerful saw, super, super square and accurate fence, which is one of the main things you're looking for on a table saw. The fence has to stay square to the blade. The blade has to stay square to these miter slots to get accurate results. This one will do that, the skill will do that, and many other higher end saws, such as the Delta 36725, like I had previously, now the T2 model replaced that. That's the best table saw under $1,000 in my opinion, if you're looking for a table saw, or what I like is the saw stop because of that safety technology, but if your budget doesn't allow that, these other options are good as well.
First on the list has to be the crosscut sled. The most accurate jig for my shop cutting 90 degree cuts is this crosscut sled. I use it all the time. This is a very simple jig to make. This is my iteration, has handles on it. It's called a safer crosscut sled. First thing you're gonna do is cut two three and a half inch pieces and glue those together. This is three quarter inch plywood that you're using. Make sure it's flat, straight plywood. A decent grade of plywood is recommended here. But you can find those at your local home store. It's usually called sanded birch or something like that. Now, once you get those two pieces glued up, you're gonna leave those to the side and you're gonna work on the base. The base is literally whatever size tabletop you have on your table saw. So for me, I made mine to fit the saw stop, but you can make these for the job site saws as well. Just depends on your tabletop size. Just make it close to that tabletop size. It should be good to go. From there, you're just gonna cut out a couple of strips that fit in the T-slots of your table saw. So most of them are about three quarter inches wide, but you wanna make sure those fit. It's best to use hardwood here or the UHMW plastic that you can buy online as well. I use hardwood for mine. All you have to do is set those in your table saw slots, put a little CA glue or fast drying glue, and then set your plywood on top of it. That's gonna match or marry those two together. And from there, you can pre-drill and screw those runners into the base to secure it. Just make sure you don't use screws that are too long so it doesn't break the top. Once you have those attached, you're just gonna cut a slot, raise the blade up through there, and cut a slot in this plywood. Now, don't rip all the way to each end or you'll just cut two pieces of plywood in half and you don't have a sled. You just got two pieces of plywood. Before I attached the fence, I took a chamfer bit and I went ahead and put a small chamfer on the bottom. That way, on the bottom inside, that way that you don't get any wood dust or chips that clog up the area. From there, I just use a framing square to kind of get this close. We're fixing to square this up using the five cut method, but to get it close, that's really all you need to do. Just get it close. On the right side, I went ahead and put a screw in to attach this permanently, but on the left side, I'm just using a quick clamp to hold it in place. Once you get it pretty close using the clamp, I just went ahead and attached that with the screw. Now on my system, after I had the fence done and the slot cut, I went ahead and removed this fence before I got it perfectly square, and I cut these dovetail slots in there. What that's gonna do is let me use these dovetail clamps, that way I will be able to hold small parts, as well as have a miter fence that I can add to this sled using the dovetail hardware. You wanna put these dovetail grooves in before you attach the fence so that you can get them to the right spot. That's why it's important to mark where the fence was before you take it off. On this sled, I added the mounts for the handles and then I cut off any excess from the back that I didn't think was necessary. It's gonna reduce the weight and it's just gonna make it a little more usable. Then I went ahead and attached this back fence. That's gonna give it a place to hold the two pieces together when you cut the thing in half. Now what's holding this together is the back fence and the fence closest to you. That way you don't just have two pieces of plywood flopping around. Now I'm gonna use the five cut method to get this fence as square as humanly possible in my workshop anyway. All you do here is you're taking a piece of scrap wood that's 10 or 12 inches square-ish, and then you're just gonna start making cuts and you're gonna rotate it a quarter turn every cut for four cuts. On the fifth cut, when you rotate it that quarter turn, you're gonna basically cut a slice off of this piece of wood. You'll measure both ends and see how far out of square you are. And there's a five cut method calculator that I'll drop in the description that tells you your tolerance and which way you need to move things. In this instance, mine was 0 0.02 inches out. So I used a feeler gauge to move this 0 0.02 and that dialed it right in. Do the five cut method again, just to double check things. And once it's as close as you think you'll ever need it, it's good. It's good. <laughs> once I got this one dialed in, it was 0 0.007 of an inch square. That's close enough for me. From there, I'm just gonna use screws on the bottom side to lock this in place to ensure that it never moves. Now all that's left to complete this was to mount the handles as well as put in the T-track on top of the fence. Standard T-track, standard three quarter inch wide slot. This gives me a place to use a stop block. Now once this is built, I literally never have to build it again. Like it's just, a, I've had this for well over a year, maybe a couple years, and it's just an essential part of the wood shop that I think every woodworker should have in their shop. Link below to the full build video if you want to build one for yourself, as well as plans available for this project. Next on the list, I think every wood shop should have, especially if you don't have a jointer or if you're building tapered legs, is this. It's just a small piece of plywood. This is one of the simplest jigs you're gonna build. Again, I'm using the match fit system because it works so well and because I use it on my crosscut sled, I can use it on this and it just makes everything much easier and more cost effective to keep using the same system. This is not Again, this is three quarter inch plywood. You can literally build all of these jigs out of the same sheet of plywood. Cut this about three, four, five foot long, whatever you want. This one's three foot long. This works well for my table saw. All you do is take your dovetail bit and route down this length of this about two inches from the end. 
And then from there, you'll just divide out five of these dovetail grooves to go across the grain. This allows you to joint the edges of boards and cut tapers if you need to do that. And it's using the match fit system, so everything's nice and secure in there. You wanna be careful and not let the clamp stick out the edge of this because of the way it rides close to that blade. You don't wanna hit the blade with one of those clamps. It'll damage your blade. But under normal circumstances, just using it as a jointer, which most people will do, just edge jointing boards, this works awesome. I didn't put a runner on the bottom of mine to run down the slot. I just let it ride against the riving knife basically every time. I've never had any issues with that. You can do the same thing, or if you want it to run on that runner, you can do it just like we did the crosscut sled and install a runner on the bottom to run in your T-slot. The next jig I think you should make, especially if you have a miter saw and you cut small parts, is a miter saw sled. It's not even really a sled. It's more of a faux table to set on top of your miter saw. What this does is give you zero clearance in the back as well as the front so you can cut those small parts safer and cleaner because it's zero clearance. You're getting less tear out there. All you have to do is measure the width and the depth at 90 degrees and then cut a piece of plywood and or MDF, depending on what you want to use. You can use the same plywood we're using for the other jigs and cut that to size. From there, I cut two small strips and glued them under the backside, touching the miter saw on each side, and that's gonna hold that in place left and right. From there, I cut a fence that's about three inches tall and just CA glued that to the back to temporarily stick it in place. Next, you wanna set the depth setting so that it does not cut all the way through your jig because you don't wanna cut, again, if you cut this in half, then you just have two pieces sitting side by side. So I set my depth setting to cut about an eighth inch deep and just made that cut. Now you can do 45s as well if you do a lot of 45 cuts, but if you just do 90 degree cuts for small parts, then I wouldn't even cut the 45s. What that's gonna do is give you a zero clearance and it gives you an exact spot where that blade is cutting every single time. So it's much easier to line up your cuts and you'll get the same repetitive cut every time, making things more accurate. And for small parts, this is where this is specifically needed because if you're trying to cut small parts on a miter saw, if you've ever tried to, you know that the fences don't come close enough together. So when you try to cut that small part, it has a tendency to try to roll back with the blade. I've done this and it scared me. I literally broke my thumb doing it because of the kickback. It's just dangerous and unnecessary when you can build something so simple in about five or 10 minutes. This just keeps everything nice and safe. And then if you pair that with a million dollar stick to hold those things down, this is a great way to cut those small parts. Not a lot of people have a handsaw to be able to cut these accurately square and to length every time. So this is one of the better methods I've found. Of course, you could also do this on the crosscut sled, cutting very small parts. But if you're using the miter saw a lot, this would be a handy jig for you. Before we get to this handy little jewel, let me tell you about the planer sled. Now, if you have a planer and you have a board that's twisted, this is the best way I found to get the twist out of that board. Again, very simple. Three quarter inch piece of plywood as wide as your planer is. So in this instance, mine's 13 inches wide. I've got a board that's about 12 inches or so wide. Doesn't have to be exact, just close. And then you're just gonna glue and screw a little strip on one end to keep that from basically keep the planer from pulling the board off of your sled. The only thing you need to make sure here is that that plywood is nice and straight and flat. Once you have that done, all you have to do is put your board on there, shim it up so that it's not rocking. Once you have it shimmed, you're just gonna run that through the planer. Make sure you run the cleat side, in other words, the board you put on the end first, because that planer is wanting to pull that board that way. Then just run it through until you have the same surface all the way across. This is gonna flatten that one side. From there, you're just gonna flip the board over, we'll start running that through until the other side is parallel to the bottom side. You got two parallel sides and you've removed the twist from that board with a very, very simple jig that anyone can make. I'll show you this jig, but I got one bonus for you if you stick around. Now this is for the router table. This is one of the safest, best ways I've ever found to cut across the grain or cut slots or anything like that in your wood. This jig idea was given to me from my friend Mike at TateTools.com. I highly recommend you check him out. You're going to take a piece of plywood and cut it 10 inches square. This is 10 inches by 10 inches. Then you just need a piece of plywood that's two and a half inches tall, 11 inches long. I drilled two one and a half inch holes in each corner. That's the jig. <laughs> now, if you're using the router table and you're trying to cut basically a narrow piece, cut a groove across that. In this instance, I was trying to cut a dovetail groove across the grain or across the width of the board. This board's only about three or four inches wide. If you tried to do that without this jig, there's no support for it. So there's no way to hold that perfectly square. Now with this jig, you're gonna put it up against the fence of your router table, set that distance that you're gonna to wanna to cut that groove away from the end. And then this gives that support. It's gonna do two things. One, it's gonna keep it from rocking. 
and two, it's gonna keep it from tearing out when you finish that cut. Because if you don't have anything back there supporting it, a lot of times you'll get blowout or tear out there. This is one of the simplest jigs to make your router table much, much safer. Now there's a thin rip jig for the table saw that I've recommended multiple times. This is one of the handiest jigs you can have, especially if you're cutting very thin strips. And where this comes in handy for me is if I'm putting trim on say like my miter station or even this workbench and I need to cut thin strips to go around certain things. This is really, really handy to have. It cuts very accurate, it's very easy to use, and it's not very expensive. I'll drop a link in the description below to all of these builds for step-by-step -step guides on how to build these jigs, as well as plans available for the ones that I have. One thing to note, these upgrades aren't meant to do all at one time. This is something you kind of plan for and do over a period of time, which is what I have done over the last seven and a half years. It's taken a while, but we slowly get there. on the list is lumber storage. Now, it took me a while to add this to my shop, but I wish I had done it much, much sooner because now that it's up off the floor and out of the way, it just frees up a lot more floor space and it keeps everything nice and organized. Now, I'm using these from Bora. They're called Bora Wood Racks. I'll link to everything in the pinned comment and the description to help you find these easier, but they are very easy to install. Literally, just find a couple of studs and drill into them. They hold like few hundred pounds, 300 pounds, something like that. I thought at first when I put these up there, I was quite nervous that they weren't gonna be able to hold the weight because I do have one of them stacked full of hardwoods, but they've been up there for over a year now and not a single issue. They hold all of this lumber. They hold a bunch more than what you would think. Another concern I had about these were because it only has two posts, I thought that the lumber would sway or bend or bow or twist. That's not been the case. They've been flat and kept everything nice and flat. I think these are some of the best value lumber racks you could buy. If you don't wanna buy these, you can certainly build your own or build your own lumber cart, et cetera. It just depends on how much space you have and how you prefer to store your lumber. The number two upgrade I recommend everyone make is lighting. Now lighting makes a huge difference when you're able to see your projects, your cut lines, where you're marking. It makes a massive difference in the shop. If you're working in a garage and it's usually have one or two regular light bulbs up there, when you upgrade the lighting, it'll be literally like night and day. These that I have in here are called Barinas, I think. I've had these for a few years now and they daisy chain together. There's 10 of them. You put five on one circuit, five on the other circuit. In other words, five on one plug in, five on the other. And then you just hook them together. And when you power one on, all of them come on or at least five of them come on. And it really does brighten the shop up massively over what a regular light bulb will do. This will make a giant difference in your shop and it won't break the bank. I think 10 of these cost about $200, maybe a little less, where you can get five of them for about half of that. So just a small investment will make a big difference in your shop. So this is what it's like when I don't have those lights on, but when I do turn them on, you can see a massive difference night and day. Shop lights on. Pretty big difference, huh? The number three upgrade I suggest you make is if it can be mobile, make it mobile. One of the first things I built for my shop was a mobile tool cart for my planer to be able to move it around. Later, I built a new cart to hold my planer and my jointer as well as several other tools. And it is also mobile, so you can move it around wherever you need it. That makes a big difference in small shops because you can move things out of the way or outside or out in the middle of the floor or anywhere you need to to actually get the work done. And then you can store it out of the way when you're done. Also, mobile bases for other tools like bandsaws. I bought a Win one first. I don't really recommend that one. It kind of failed on me but I did wind up upgrading to a Grizzly brand and it works very well. Make sure you get a good quality, read those reviews on those mobile carts that fit your bigger tools, because that will make a difference. But being able to move that in and out of the way has been huge. I can have a good size bandsaw in the shop, but it doesn't take up a bunch of floor space. And if it's in the way, literally just roll it out of the way. And also the saw stop big old table saw is also on a mobile cart so that I can move that around the shop because there's only about three and a half feet between the garage door and the saw. So a lot of times I'll move it around over there on the other side of the workbench and use that to saw wood and et cetera. Use this as my outfeed table and still have enough room behind me that I can cut large sheet goods, et cetera, with the garage door closed. I also had this rolling five drawer mobile workstation that I bought uh, from Milwaukee Packout. You just move this around the shop. I like having that around when I'm building or working on something. I can just move that cart where I need it, but it's on wheels as well. If it can be on wheels, put it on wheels. 
speaking of tools, another upgrade I suggest you make is tool upgrades and not buying new tools to replace your old tools, but replacing the stock blades that come on your tools. You'll see a big difference in a lot of different tools. Even the saw stop come with a very cheap blade on it. I like CMT orange chrome, especially for my table saw. That's what I run most of the time, a 52 combination blade. I like that style blade, just gets a lot done. And they're not overly expensive. They are a little more pricey, but you do get what you pay for there. They're one of my favorite blades for that saw. But I also like the Diablo line of blades because they're a very good value and you get a lot out of them. I used them for years on my miter saw as well as my table saw. Never had any issues with them. They stay sharp a decent amount of time. I do think the CMTs last quite a bit longer. That's why I tend to gravitate toward those. But if you're on a budget, definitely look at those Diablo line. Now, if you just want the top tier blades, buy once, cry once type things, look at Ridge Carbide or even the Forest line of blades. Although I'm a more of a fan of the Ridge Carbide than I am the Forest, but that's probably personal preference. Also think about your router bits. If you're using the more budget line, say like Skill, et cetera, they're, they're really not meant for a lot of production work. They'll get by for a few projects. But once you start making a lot of stuff, you want to look at more higher end bits. I like the white side brand. There's a four piece set that I really recommend for beginners. It has the chamfer, it has a round over, and then two flush trim bits, one with the top bearing, one with the bottom. I think that's a really good starter set for under $100. And these things last a very long time, uh, just using them in under normal conditions. Another good tool upgrade you could make is the miter gauge that comes with most table saws. I know Harvey comes with a really good one. But other than that, the saw stop doesn't really come with a great one. I like the Incro line. It will fit in standard T slots on most all table saws, even the uh, DeWalt job site style saw. The Incro B27 is the model number. It's under $100. It's a very nice, very nice miter gauge, very accurate. So if you want to look at one of those, it's a good upgrade to make. Another upgrade suggestion is tool organization and storage. And there's a bunch of ways to do this. You can make your own or you can buy it. There's, I guess, two ways to do it. But there's a bunch of different options here to store and keep your tools organized. And that's where the efficiency comes in. Because if you always know where to grab your tools, where they're located, you'll be able to work faster. And I know a lot of people are on time crunches. They're trying to balance their family life with their work life, with their side woodworking business, and they re time really is of the essence. So looking for a tool for 20 minutes wastes so much time. If you know where it's at, it makes your life much easier. Here's what I'm using. I love this clamp storage. This is from Rockler. You can hold different styles. In other words, you buy the different ones, either pipe clamps, parallel clamps, or F-style clamps. You can also build your own. I've built some that I put right here on the end of the workstation and really just cut those out of a CNC, but you could do it with a jigsaw or anything else like that. Just making a clamp racks makes your life easier because you know where your clamps are, you can access them, and then you can store them out of the way because you know if you start collecting a bunch of clamps, those things start piling up and they really do get in the way. Another good option is to add a tool wall to your shop. A lot of people love French cleats. Those work extremely well. Then you can build any size piece that you need to hold the tools or the parts and pieces that you need. I went with Omni wall. We partnered on a video. There's a whole video on how to install this stuff. I really like this set. There is places for your drills. There's shelves for your batteries and chargers and just a whole basically organization system. This is not that you can put into your shop, including socket holders and all kinds of stuff. But it is a little pricey, so it'll steer a lot of people away from this. So if you wanna build your own, it's a good option to do that and get your tools up where you can see them. They're easy to access. Another option for storage are toolboxes you can buy at the big box stores. I bought this at Home Depot. This is called a Husky. There's a video on me assembling this. This is a Husky Hutch, and it comes with one side cabinet, and I purchased another side cabinet to match. And this is what I'm doing with mine. In one side, I've got paints and glues all stored in there. Yep, that's a pretty good way to store those. On the other side, I have my cordless tool stored on the top. And then down on the bottom, I have lumber stored, scrap, scrap wood down there. Now, the drawers is really where I'm able to stay organized. And this was kind of my goal of like 2021 is to get organized. Now, I'm using these little small boxes are on Amazon. I'll link to those. They are very inexpensive and they're perfect for holding small parts and odds and ends. You get like 32 boxes for like, I don't know, not a lot of money, less than $30, right around $30. And this really helps you stay organized. My set of Tecton wrenches here came with these organizers and that's really handy to keep those all in one spot. The little small parts organizers are also perfect for tools or even loose sockets, whatever you got to store, wrenches, pliers, anything. But I'm not without my junk drawers. I have a few down here that just collect random stuff. So 
Uh, just be cautious about stuffing too much in drawers. I'm guilty of that myself. Next on the list, small parts organization. As you start woodworking and building your shop, you'll start gathering up screws, bolts, nuts, etc. And these things can really get jumbled up. So having a way to keep those separated is a really good option. I showed some really nice affordable boxes just to, like a couple of weeks ago on the channel. These are from Tay Tools. You can get like a set of four, very inexpensive. These are excellent little storage boxes for the price. You can also pick up stuff like this Milwaukee one, not pack out. This one's much less expensive than the pack out or rigid. Most everybody, tool brands, making these small ports organized. You can pick these up anywhere. I'll link to my favorites in the description below. This is a great way to keep everything nice and organized. This will really, really speed up your process when you know exactly where that inch and a quarter pocket hole screw is versus that three inch regular wood screw is. You just, it really helps keeping all that stuff organized. It helps you work much faster. And of course you can use pack out or whatever tool brand you like that has those organizers to keep your bits tools everything else like that stored i like my pack out but you do you and speaking of small parts organization don't sleep on magnetic trays you can get these about anywhere i've got some link down below to amazon you can get these at harbor freight etc but they're really great to hold bits and parts and pieces and screws these things are really handy to have Another upgrade I really encourage people to do when they can is flooring. Now, a lot of people have like epoxy floors in their garage. Well, some people, most of us have uh, concrete, which is what I have. And standing on that for hours on end really does bother my back, my legs, my feet. And so one thing that I did early on was I started buying what they call horse stall mats. You can buy them at uh, any farm store, uh, like tractor supply, or if you got a local farm store, Ask about horse stall mats. These usually come in four foot by six foot pieces and they're about three quarters of an inch thick. These things are heavy and they're really hard to move around. But once you get them in place, they typically stay there. Now what that did was it really did relieve a lot of stress. These are very hard rubber mats. So you can still roll your tools around without any issues, but it doesn't hurt your back and legs like concrete does. And it does absorb a little bit of sound, so it's not as loud. And it also absorbs things that fall off the workbench onto like your tools when they fall off. So it doesn't hit hard concrete, it's hitting that rubber mat. So it does make quite a bit of difference in a shop. Now these are a little pricey at about 40-ish dollars a piece. And what I did was bought two, and then like a few weeks later, I bought two more. And then my kids got me some for Father's Day one year. And so I just added them over time until I could get the whole shop whole garage floor covered with them. So it did take a little bit of time, but if you have the money to invest in something like that, it's a good option. Next on the list, one of the best upgrades I've made, especially because I'm in South Arkansas and the humidity is so high here, like we're talking 80, 90, 100% humidity most of the summer, a dehumidifier. Now these are a little more pricey too, depending on what model you get. But I have run one of these in this shop since like 2019-ish and it has made a massive difference. Even though I do have a mini split now, before I had the mini split, the, the dehumidifier runs all the time. I have a hose that goes under the garage door and out to the side of the house and drains so that I don't have to empty the tank because I tried to empty in the tank and I was doing it like two times, three times a day. These things make a massive difference in the way the temperature feels even if you don't have climate control. So if it's 95 degrees outside, you have the dehumidifier on, Humidity outside is 90 to 90%, inside is 35%. It makes a massive difference, massive difference. And another benefit is your tools don't rust as fast or at all. I've had zero issues with rust since I put in the dehumidifier and that was well before I got the mini split. Even my gym equipment, a lot of it's bare steel stuff. It doesn't rust. A lot of people have rust issues with this stuff. Cast iron tops on your table saw, on your jointers, etc this dehumidifier will solve most of that. Another upgrade I encourage a lot of people to make if you're in a garage is insulating the garage door. I thought this was gonna be expensive and I thought it was going to be a pain in the rear, but literally all this is is like a piece of one inch foam, hard foam board that you can buy at any home store. They just cut to fit in between these panels. This makes a really big difference. That's the east side of the house. So in the mornings, the sun rises and shines right on this garage door until about noon or a little after. And so this door heats up big time in the summer. 
this has made a big difference. And in the winter, actually, it's made a lot of big difference too because this metal gets so cold. Uh, this really does help a lot too. This is one of the least expensive upgrades you can do to your shop that does make quite a bit of difference. And they also make uh, kits that for garage doors too that you could purchase. Uh, if you wanna do one of the kits, it probably looks a little cleaner, a little better, but this board works well too. And I always get this question, how do you hang your track saw tracks on a garage door? These are called um, track racks that I got on Amazon. I'll link to those as well. You can also use these on the wall or garage door or anything like that. They work really well to keep your tracks up out of the way. If you wanna stick around after number 10, I got a couple of bonus picks for you that will really help upgrade your shop. Number 10 on the list is an extra work table that you can put away. Now, I recently done a video on this topic. These are really handy for extra finishing tables and just extra workspace when you run out of or you have a project on your normal workbench. Having an extra workbench in the shop. Now, how do you have an extra workbench if you have one that's already taken up a bunch of space? Well, it needs to be storable. In other words, you need to be able to fold it up, get it out of the way, then you pull it out only when you need it. So if you're having to finish extra product or you just need a place to put things while you're working on another project. These are excellent options for you. I like the Boris Centipedes, probably my pick for most people because it takes up very minimal space and you can literally just buy the base and then use a piece of plywood. But the top is very nice, gives you some clamping options, etc. And then there's also the Ryobi Speed Bench as well as the Festival MFT table. You can build your own. I built one that you can fold and unfold up. There's a whole video on that that I'll link to in the description plans for that. You can buy one of these or build one of these, but these are so handy to have. I use them all the time in the shop, especially when I'm finishing or letting things dry. So if I give something a mineral oil bath, that's where I use these the most. Next on the list is dust collection. And this is a big deal for a lot of people because dust collection can be pricey, but there's ways to work your way up to that. One way I did it was when I first started, all I had was a rigid shop vac. Use what you got, right? And so I use that for quite a long time. Now, a shop vac fills up quite fast if you're using table saws, etc. But there's good ways around that. That's to use a dust separator. I bought this dust right separator. It works really well. I've used it with a CNC. I've used it with the table saw, even the planer, etc. It really does help filter out the big chunks before they go to your shop vac. So it doesn't fill your vac up and stop your filters up, etc. as fast. These are really good options if you're on a budget or you're just starting out. The next dust collection thing I think most people should get is a dust extractor. Now there's a bunch of different brands out there that make these. DeWalt makes one, I've had one for years, used it for a while. Festool makes one, I like the Festool, that's what I use. But there's other brands out there, Bosch, Fiend, you just make your pick. Just make sure it has a HEPA filter in there, that's what you're looking for. And also your shop vac should also have a HEPA filter if it is available. And then last but not least, while you're, if you're on the way to upgrading, there's a lot of dust collectors out there. A lot of brands make dust collectors. Harbor Freight, I hear a bunch of good things about the Harbor Freight dust collector. I've never used it. I just get a lot of feedback from people. I have the Laguna P-Flux one. You can look at Harvey. And if I was doing things over, I would probably really, really look at Oneida. I have nothing invested in them, get nothing out of it. I think they have one of the better systems for garage woodworkers that I've seen. Uh, that may be something I'll upgrade to at some point. And then if budget allows, there are dust filtration systems. I have the Laguna Clean Air. This thing is massively important. Anytime I'm running saws or CNC's, I'll turn this on and it'll filter down to like 0.1 microns. It really, really makes a huge difference on the fine dust. Wynn makes one of these, Jet, DeWalt. Like you can find one of these uh, dust filtration systems most anywhere that you buy your tools. They are really, really nice. A lot of people hang them on the ceiling so it circulates the air. I've got mine sitting on the toolbox. Wherever you want to put it, just make sure it's a little bit elevated. Those things work. Now for the bonus picks, this isn't for everyone because not everyone, A, wants them and two, has the budget or even wants to spend their money on something like this, but they are extremely cool. You should check these out and see what they can do. One is a mini split or climate control. If you can budget this into your shop, eventually, it doesn't have to be immediately, but it's kind of like I had a goal of getting one one day when I finally was able to buy one. It has made a massive difference in just being able to be comfortable in the shop while you're working. No matter if it's cold outside or hot outside, they really are nice to have. I went with the Mr. Cool, like a 24,000 BTU. My wife and I installed this ourselves and then I hired an electrician just to wire it up, but they're very easy to install. Most anybody can do it. They're awesome. 2A, if you can budget one of these, they will 
you, you'll have endless fun with these and be able to basically make anything you want to store anything you want. It is a 3D printer. I went with the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon. I purchased this one uh, about six or eight months ago. They have a less expensive model that's like a couple hundred dollars all the way up to this model. Uh, so you can really depends on your budget or how much you want to invest in one of these. But I have been able to make some of the coolest storage and organization products with this. That's why I bought it is because I was trying to get everything organized, especially for like custom parts, like pack out inserts to store tools or bits or even parts and piece organizers. The options are endless. There's tons of files out there on the internet that you can purchase or download for free. I'll link to some of my favorite ones in the description where I get a lot of these files at. I don't design these things. I did design one. I designed a CA glue holder that holds all of my CA glue. That file's available if you want to download it on my website. These things are so fun to have in the shop. There's only one other tool that I've had more fun with than this, and that would be 2B. 2B is a CNC. Now, a lot of people aren't interested in CNCs, but a lot of people are. I got the Shape Hoko 5 Pro 4x2. I think it's the best CNC for small shops. In other words, space saving. It's only taken up like three foot by five foot-ish amount of room. This thing has been absolutely amazing. I have created some of the coolest stuff for this thing, including organizational stuff, but also money producing things. I've been able to sell quite a bit of product off of this machine, and that's where these things really shine. I think they're really good for production work. If you're making trays or templates or custom work, putting custom designs and things, this is where this stuff really shines. I think a lot of people underestimate the amount of money you can make with a CNC, but even if you don't want to make money, if that's not your end goal, they're still massively fun to have to make custom products for your family, your friends, or even customers. Number one and easiest upgrade you can make to your table saw is absolutely the blade. The blades they send with most table saws are absolute trash. Even the stock blade that came on the saw stop is not that great. They're trash. They just throw them in there because they can, I don't know. Most table saws are like that. With the exception of the DeWalt job site saw I have here, this blade's actually pretty good for what you're getting. Now there's several different blades to choose from out there and if you start looking, it gets confusing on what is the best blade for you. I'm gonna give you my picks from Good Better Best. Good, a lot of people will kind of frown on this, but the Diablo line of blades are very good for what you're paying for them. They're very inexpensive and they last a decent amount of time. Now, they will not last as far as sharpness goes as long as some of these other brands, but if you just want one that's in a good budget range, these are good blades. I ran them for years on my old Delta table saw. Kind of the middle of the road, the one that I really go with the most, the one I think most people should buy is the CMT Chrome Edition blades. I've been running these for a couple of years now, especially a good 50, 60 tooth, 40 tooth all-purpose blade. These are fantastic blades. In that tooth range, 40 to 60 is kind of a combo tooth, so you can do cross cuts and rip cuts and not really have to worry about much tear out. If you're doing a lot of cross cutting or sheet goods, then 80 tooth or so would be better. But for most of us, the 40 to 60 tooth range is perfect. I usually keep a 40 tooth blade on my table saw in most conditions, 40 to 50 tooth, depending on which one I can find on sale. There are some really good high end blades too if you're doing a lot of work, especially like production work, or if you just wanna buy once, cry once, get the best of the best. There's two here that I have. I've used this forest blade before. I think it compares really closely to the CMT line. I really wasn't overly impressed with it. Now, one thing that I have liked though is the Ridge Carbide. They did send me this to try out. I've been running it on the table saw for a few weeks now, and I've been very impressed with the quality of this blade, and it's made right here in the USA and by a good small company. So, so far I like it. I'll link to all of those in the description. You can make your decision on what works best for your saw. While we're on the topic of blades, if you don't have a good dado set, I bought this one myself a couple of years ago and it has been an absolute awesome thing to have as far as the table saw, especially if you start doing half laps or you're cutting dados. This dado set is absolutely necessary as an upgrade and not really bad for the price. It'll save you way more time than what you're actually spending on the price of the dado. The number two upgrade that will not break the bank is a miter gauge. Even this saw stop costs almost $4,000, comes with an embarrassingly bad miter gauge. I don't know why they cheap out on this stuff, but you can get an upgrade, which I did. I purchased this one. This is an Incra V27. This is a very good miter gauge for the price. It's a simple design. You can put a faux fence on it if you want. What I like about the Incra V27 is it fits in a standard T-slot, so it'll work on this job site saw as well as the bigger cabinet saw. But this is one of those tools that you will never regret buying, 
and it's less than $100. I think they're around $80 or so, uh, depending on the day or the deal you get. This is a good, good upgrade to make for your miter saw. And if you got a little more money to spend, you want something a little bit nicer, a lot more features, you can check out the Harvey Compass. They sent me this a few years ago, and I just love having it. They do have an upgraded version now that has a few more features than this one, but this one has been good to me. I like it that it has the fence already on there. It has a lot of micro adjustments that you can use. It's just an overall well-made tool that I've had zero trouble out of. The third upgrade you should make to your table saw is to build you a crosscut sled. If you've never done this, this is one of the easiest builds you can do. All it takes is some plywood, a little bit of time, and some good plans. I've got some good plans on this one. This is my iteration on a crosscut sled. It has handles on the back to make it safer so that your hands are never near that blade. It's one of the things I love most about this sled. It also has a miter fence that lets you cut any angle that you so choose. Because I use the match fit system, you can use their clamps here as well to hold down the parts so you can ensure that your hands don't have to get anywhere near that blade. That's why I call this the safer crosscut sled and stop block so you can cut most anything. Now what you're gonna use this most for is cutting small parts or to ensure you're getting square cuts. That's one of the main things I use this thing for, especially if I wanna make sure every side is completely square because I know for a fact this is square because I built it that way. And the great thing about this sled is you can adjust it to fit any miter saw. It'll fit on a job site saw, it'll fit on one of these saws. All you'd have to do is make it a little narrower or wider depending on your saw. It's pretty easy to do. I have a whole video on how to make this that way you get yours exactly right too. I'll link that in the card above as well as in the description. 3B is the tapering and jointing jig. These are extremely easy to make. All you need is a piece of plywood, a dovetail bit, and a router. Anybody can make these and it's gonna make your life easier. If you don't have a jointer, you can edge joint with this jig as well as taper if you're making tapered legs or any other thing you need tapered. This is one of the handiest little jigs that's very easy to make. It'll take you about 20 or 30 minutes to make it max. And it's something you'll use all the time. I have a whole video on jointing without a jointer. I'll also link down there, which includes how to build this. And the last jig is this. Kind of looks like a spaceship thing. This is a thin rip jig. It goes into any standard T-slot. What I like about this jig is it's cutting the thin pieces on the left side of the blade. In other words, you're gonna set this jig to the thickness of the thin stock you want. So if it's 1 8 inch, you'll cut that first piece an eighth inch, then you'll move your fence over, make the second cut. That second cut's also gonna be an eighth of an inch. Then you move your fence over. You don't wind up having such a tiny space between the blade and the fence that you can't get that cut, or not safely anyway. I like this because it's cheap and it works. Number four on the list is this. It's a Jessam stock guides. If you cut a lot of sheet goods or even thinner stock, this really helps hold the stock against the fence. Because of the way these things are designed, they have rollers that are kind of slightly tilted towards your fence, and it literally pulls the stock or the plywood or the wood, whatever you're cutting, toward the fence. Keeps it pressed tight against the fence so you don't have any deviation in your cuts. This is an extremely easy upgrade. Jessel makes some amazing tools. I've been extremely pleased with this. I built this jig based on a design my friend had. I have free plans for this jig. If you, if you have a saw stop and you wanna make the same kind of jig, they're on the website. It's using two mag switches to keep it in place. These lock it down tight. It never budges from there. And then you can adjust these stock guides anywhere you need them to make the cuts that you need. This has been one of the better upgrades I've made to my table saw. And when they're not in use because they're in mag switch, I can mag switch them to my metal storage cabinets and I, it's just up and out of the way. Or you can hang it. There's a hole here designed so that you can hang it on the wall keep them out of the way and safe from getting damaged. The good thing about the Jessam stock guides is they can be adapted. You can make jigs to fit basically any table saw that you're using. The only downside to the Jessam stock guides is if you don't have a table saw with a fence similar to this, you'll have to come up with your own jig to fit it to your table saw. That's not hard. We're woodworkers, we build stuff. Stick around after number five. I've got a bonus pick for you that's gonna help make your cuts that much cleaner. Also, I'll give you a way to save some money off my crosscut sled plan or any other plans we have available. five on the list <laughs> feather boards and or push sticks i know i know it's a boring topic but listen to me there have been multiple people injured by the push stick that comes with their table saw i made a video about that there's the thumbnail what it looks like and i'll put it in the description below but typically the push stick that comes with your table saw isn't that great it's just plastic those can shatter and cause massive injuries to your arms face torso 
etc. I, I highly recommend throwing that thing in the trash and getting a proper one or building your own out of wood. It's really not that difficult to make push sticks depending on what style you like. Obviously the micro jig gripper is one of the best that I recommend because it can basically go over the blade and still keep your hand safe so long as the blade is low enough. That's one of the things you have to watch out for. It is really great when you're cutting thin stock so that you can adjust this little foot. Still gives you quite a bit of balance there. They've recently come out with the Gripper Row 2, which is also a really nice little push stick and it works in a few different ways. But overall, I like the Gripper better. Bow Products makes some push sticks also that have a foam tip. So if it does hit the blade, it just cuts the foam and doesn't damage the plastic. Those are pretty nice as well. And then there are feather boards. Feather boards help keep your stock pushed against the fence, similar to these stock guides. So if you don't have a set of stock guides, this is the next best thing. I made a video with like five different jigs on how to use these in various ways to keep vertical pressure, horizontal pressure, but these bow feather boards are fantastic. And because they are made of that EVA foam, if it does get into the blade, it's not going to throw chunks of shards of plastic back at you. It's just foam. It's not gonna injure you as long as you got your eye protection on. One of the great things about these bow feather boards is the fact that these inserts are replaceable. So if you do damage them, you can just buy a replacement. Because they're foam, they're not gonna mar your wood, but at the same time, they give plenty of pressure against the fence to help prevent some kickback as well as keep it tight against the fence so your cuts are accurate. As far as making your own push sticks, you do whatever you do. <laughs> you can come up with any design you want. There's this tile design that's pretty popular. This, is, this one works well. I've even gotten into the blade a little bit with this one but this keeps your hands pretty good away from the blade, but I like this one as well. This is from a friend at All Red Woodworks. This is his design. Basically, this keeps your hand way up and away from the blade, especially when you're cutting the thinner wood. All right, after the bonus tip, I'm gonna give you a power tip, okay? Here's the bonus tip. Get a zero clearance insert for your table saw. I know the Delta slash rigid table saws have them available, especially like on Etsy's where I bought mine. They were just MDF inserts, but that's gonna keep your cuts really clean on the bottom of the cut. And it prevents pieces from falling down in there or if you're cutting thin stock from getting jammed up in there. Sometimes that's happened to me. One of the great things is with a zero clearance, it's not gonna stop up your dust collection because those chunks don't fall in there either. So it just depends on your table saw model. You can usually Google or search it for on Amazon or Etsy and find the inserts pre-made. Sawstop makes their own that you can find on Amazon as well. You know what time it is, power tip time. The power tip is, I don't care where you're at, what your skill level is, you should buy a tourniquet for your shop. Why? Because these things will stop the bleeding and allow you to have time to get help. If you cut a major artery on your table saw or any other tool in your shop, you literally have about 90 seconds before you black out, give or take. These will save your life or someone in your shop's life. Make sure you buy a name brand and not a knockoff brand. You do not want something breaking on these when you're trying to put them on somebody. It's, that would be catastrophic. What's the purpose of even having one? You may have to spend five or 10 more dollars to get the name brand, but absolutely get one of these. Make sure you watch videos on how to apply these properly. I'll link to a good one in the description and then practice with them on yourself. If you don't practice with them, you'll have no idea what to do when the crap hits the fan. Make sure you're applying these monthly, weekly, however you feel comfortable training with them, but train to put them on your leg, your arm, etc. These will save your life for somebody you love. My closest Home Depot is 90 miles away. Well, give or take a few miles. It's a long drive for me to go to Home Depot, but I love going there because I love looking for deals and I've got some deal secrets for you in store and online. Let's do it. Home Depot shopping secret number one. Did you know that you could actually get 10% off of a damaged box? Check this out. I was in Home Depot a while back and found this very large DeWalt brand air compressor and the box was pretty trashed. It wasn't terrible. However, that would qualify if the manager approves for a 10% off. I didn't need the air compressor because I'm out of room and don't have room for it. But if I did, then I could have went to the manager and said, hey, this box is damaged. Is there any way I can get a discount on this product? Now, you know you're gonna catch more flies with honey. So be nice and kind, basically ask for it because you don't know until you ask, but they will give you the discount in some cases, again, you have to ask for it. Now the product inside the box may be dinged or scratched or something like that, and it's not gonna affect the performance of the tool, then you're really not doing anything other than you're not the first one to put a scratch on it and you're saving 10%. Also in the lumber section, there's usually a bin of coal lumber or scrap lumber that's not gonna be sold that you can get up to 50% off on. Be sure and check the lumber aisle or the lumber area for those coal lumber deals. 
Home Depot shopping secret number two. Did you know that there's a 30 day price protection on your purchase from Home Depot or homedepot.com? If you buy a product and within the next 30 days that product price drops, you can get the difference back. So be sure and keep an eye on those products or if you go to the store a lot, you bought that DeWalt drill package last week for $2.99, you go in this week and it's $1.99, take it to the customer service desk with your receipt and they'll give you the difference. If you bought online, you could just use their online chat and give them your order number, same thing will apply. Home Depot shopping tip number three, probably the one of the best tips, except for maybe number nine, is the price tag will tell you the story of the product. Listen to me. You ever wondered if the product you're gonna buy is fixed to go on sale, that you don't wanna to have to come back and do that price match thing, uh, or how much longer is this item gonna be in stock or in sale? All you have to do is look at the price tag. If the price ends in 0 0.06, so six cents, then that product will be lowered again within the next six weeks. You can actually look, there's a date on that price tag that tells you when it was marked down. Six weeks from that day, at six cents, it's gonna be marked down again to three cents. Once it hits 0 .03, that's three weeks from the time that product's gonna be gone. It's not gonna be on the shelf. So if you see 0 .03 and you want that item, grab it then because it's, that's the lowest it's gonna be in that store. And if you have a coupon, you can actually use a coupon on top of those already discounted items. So that's a really cool thing because a lot of places don't allow you to do that. If you're in the store and you see a yellow tag, that doesn't necessarily mean that that product is on clearance while most of the time it does. Sometimes if that product doesn't have on the price tag a was price, in other words, it was $3.99 and is now $2.99, then that's just a product, it's yellow tagged, it's looking for a place in the store. They haven't found a home for it yet or haven't actually stocked it on the shelf it's supposed to go in. Moral of the story, read the price tag, it's gonna tell you the secret, and if it says 0 .06, hold off because it's gonna be discounted again, and then you can save even more money when it says 0 .03, just don't forget. Shopping secret number four for The Home Depot is they have a price guarantee. In other words, if you find the exact same product in another store, brick and mortar store for a lower price, they will actually match that price and then give you 10% on top of that. That's a sweet deal. So if you're looking for, say a DeWalt drill driver set, you find that at Lowe's for $249 and then Home Depot has it for $299. If you can prove it to them that that is on sale in that store, they'll give you that price plus 10% off. That's, that's a good deal. There are some exclusions on that. It has to be in stock at both locations. Open box items are not eligible for that. They will also match a virtual sale. In other words, you find it on Lowe's.com, Ace.com, or Menards, wherever you can find it online. They'll actually match it, but they won't give you the 10% off if it's a virtual sale. Home Depot shopping secret number five is there's actually a rebate center on the Home Depot website. It's buried way at the bottom. You gotta scroll all the way to the bottom and then you have to find where it says rebate center, click that. While there's rarely ever tool rebates there, what you can find is take for instance my mini split. This one is very similar to that. There's a $300 tax credit rebate that you can get if you get that specific mini split. So it's a good deal if you're trying to heat and air your shop. Also, if you're looking for insulation, it's getting hot, it's getting summertime, you wanna insulate your garage or your shop. You can also get a 10% up to $500 discount or rebate on insulation. So if you're looking for those type things, keep that in mind to save you some extra money. Home Depot shopping secret number six is managers have a whole lot of leadway in their store and that varies store to store and manager to manager, obviously. But if a product has low stock, in other words, there's low quantity of that product, you can actually ask the associate in that department if it's a low stock item or if it's an older stock item and then ask for a lower price because it's older or because they're just low stock on that item. And a lot of times they can override the price and give you a little discount. Again, it's up to the manager. Also, if the product you want is out of stock, it never hurts to ask the manager if the next tier up in that product line is available at the price of the out of stock item since they are out of stock. And sometimes the managers can actually lower the price to meet it if it's not too much of a discount, but that can save you some money and you can get a bump up on the tier of tool you're looking at. Again, you'll catch more flies with honey, be extremely nice, be professional, and just know that they can lower the price, but they don't have to lower the price. Home Depot, shopping secret number seven. Don't forget number nine is gonna be a doozy, so stick around. 
Number seven is workshops. Home Depot holds workshops, some virtual, some in store, depending on your store, but they hold the workshops. And at the end of the workshop, they sometimes give coupons up to 15% off. So be sure and stick around at the end of the workshop and get your 15% off coupon. And it's a great way to learn new skills and to basically build your knowledge up of the projects you're trying to make. Home Depot shopping secret number eight, coupons. Now, did you know that some Home Depots, again, up to the manager, will honor the coupons from other stores? Lowe's, Menards, Ace, lots of other brick and mortar stores when they offer coupons, like Lowe's has a movers coupon you can get. Just search it, you'll find it. Some Home Depots will actually honor that coupon because they don't offer that. Again, this is gonna come up to the manager in your specific store, but it never hurts to ask. If you have the coupon, just present it to them and say, hey, you guys don't offer this coupon, would you mind honoring it? And see if they do it. Home Depot shopping secret number nine, they have a deal of the day. You may or may not have known about this. However, I check this every single day. Now, sometimes the deal of the day is ceiling fans, sometimes it's toilets, sometimes it's tools. Most of the time it's tools. On their website, you'll see a tab that says specials and offers. If you click that, that's gonna be the deal of the day. Now, if you really wanna drill down and find the tool deals that's going on currently, all you have to do is look in that pop-up, you'll see savings by department. If you click on tools, you'll see that there's tons of tool deals there, but you can also sort by savings by tool, savings by brand, and tons of other savings options there for you on the website. Home Depot shopping secret number 10, you may or may not know about this, but did you know that Home Depot offers a 10% military discount for active duty, for veterans, and for spouses of those? All you have to do is go to their website, search military discount, also scroll to the bottom, it's down there as well. You can sign up and register the online. I think you have to register online and not in store. Go ahead and pre-register that. You can save up to $400 a year just for being a military veteran or active duty or a spouse of those. And if you are active or a spouse of those, uh, my hat's off to you. Thank you so much for your service to our country. I don't know how us uh, Americans can thank you for everything that you've done for us. We greatly appreciate what you do every day. Here's a bonus for you. Did you know that almost every Home Depot store has a clearance section where they put all the discounted items, the closeout items, stuff that's going away. You're gonna get the best deals on some of these items. So if you go check those out in my local store, local 90 miles away, my local store, it's in the back of the store next to the appliances, but it's just like an end cap of clearance items. Always walk by that and check it just to see if possibly there's something on there you just can't live without. I'm still kind of wishing I'd have got that DeWalt air compressor. I don't need it, but I was just curious if I could get the 10% off on that. The box was pretty trash. I probably should have tried. Routers are some of the most versatile tools in a wood shop. It's probably one of my most used tools in the shop. I use one of these several times a week for various tasks. You can cut grooves in wood very easily and very accurately with a router like you see here, whether that be a straight groove or a dovetail groove for different purposes. And you can do what is the most common use for most routers or edge profiles. In other words, dressing up the edge of your woodworking project so that it looks more professional. There's some dangers involved in using a router. We're gonna cover that so you feel more comfortable and safer while you do it. But first, which router do you pick? There's so many out there, so many options. How do you know which one's right for you? There's basically two different kinds of routers you're gonna be looking at, a fixed base or a plunge base. Sometimes you can get a combo fixed and plunge base, which I'd actually recommend for most people, but I've got some recommendations near the end of the video for both bits, accessories, and routers. For the most part, if you pick up a small router, these are called trim or palm routers. Both mean the same thing. These are small routers that typically go with your battery platform or like this Makita here, which I really like. It's a very affordable, smaller router. Most of these are fixed base. While some of them you can get plunge bases with them, you're most likely gonna buy them as a fixed base. And all fixed base means is it doesn't have a fast plunging option like this does. In other words, you set it and forget it and just use it like that. Now a plunge base can be useful for various tasks. If you're just wanting to make several shallow passes at different depths, you can set this up to do that. The way a plunge base router works, it has this depth stop that is completely adjustable. If this is the high setting we're gonna go, we're gonna back this off and we want to turn this little dial to the highest setting. 
From there, we're gonna lock this little pin on the side end, and then that's gonna give us our high setting. This is as high as we can go. So now every time we turn this dial, that gives us a quarter inch drop. And there's a positive stop there too. That allows me to plunge one quarter inch. I can turn it again, I can plunge another quarter. Turn it one more time and I can, again, go all the way to the bottom or through the material, however I need to set that. So what I would do is set this high setting where this bit is just touching the surface of the wood I'm going to cut. That way, every time I turn that, we're going deeper and deeper. Similar to what I did when I put this play button in the middle of this workbench. I was able to cut that pocket out for that play button to go in just by taking small shallow passes that prevents tear out. It makes it easier on your router bit and it just cuts better. Now, if you need to do fine micro adjustments to make sure you're not going too deep, you're gonna use this setting here with the little flathead screw. This allows you to dial in the perfect depth that you need. Then I also use the plunge base to surface this so that it's perfectly flat with the rest of the table. And a lot of people use plunge bases to surface wood or flatten slabs, things like that. There's a multitude of uses for a plunge base, but you can do some similar things with a fixed base. It just depends on your use case and what you're gonna be using them for. One thing I absolutely recommend, no matter which router you go with, is get a variable speed because speed matters and we'll talk about that when we get into the bits. A variable speed lets you turn down the speed that the bit is spinning and you're gonna to wanna to make sure the router you're picking has that. Most routers do, but some like this router that I have are not variable speed. It's just a fixed speed. That works okay for edge profile but when we get into the bigger bits, you're gonna to wanna to speed those down a little bit. Nearly all of these routers have the option for an edge guide. Some of them come with edge guides. Edge guides are probably one of the more useful tools that you can add to the router. I would highly recommend if you have the budget and it doesn't come with the router already, go ahead and add that to your cart. You'll use it all the time. That's gonna help you create grooves and things that are offset from the edge. And it's gonna keep you parallel to that edge. I use mine all the time. One thing a lot of beginners get confused on is what direction do you route in? If you think about a router bit similar to a table saw blade or any blade really, the blade is spinning and cutting the wood because you're feeding the board into the teeth of that blade. A router bit is not that much different as it has blades on it. No matter what style bit you're using, it's wanting to cut that wood. So you see when this one is spinning, you wanna feed that board into the bit in most cases. On this board, for instance, we're gonna be moving from left to right and you're gonna be pushing the router into the wood. You'll feel the resistance there. It's wanting to go back the opposite direction because it's spinning that way. It's like a tire on your car pushing your car down the road. This is very similar to that. It's wanting to push the router back to the left in this instant. You're just gonna put a little force into it, hold it nice and snug, and you're gonna get a nice clean cut in most cases. And I say in most cases because if the bit is chopping away at the wood and you see that wood grain right there leading out to the edge sometimes that bit will hang in that wood grain and tear that wood or split the wood especially like this it likely split that from there all the way to the end and the way you prevent that is go the opposite direction i just told you not to go it's called a climb cut you're going to give up a little bit of control because it's wanting to go that way but you can certainly control it on edge profiles, chamfers, roundovers, things like that. So you'll just go with that edge, that'll prevent that tear out from happening. So when you're routing trays, boxes, cutting boards, anything like that, you're going around the outside, you're going counterclockwise around that piece on the outside. Now when you transition to the inside and you want to put a round over there, you're going the opposite direction because that bit is contacting the wood at the opposite side. Then you would just go in a clockwise direction that's still the push cut, as they call it, and not the climb cut, which it's wanting to go. Inside clockwise, outside counterclockwise. Basically, what you need to remember. There's some common bits that most every woodworker is gonna have in their shop, and they are. Chamfer bit, usually a 45 degree chamfer. In other words, it's gonna put a 45 degree angle on your board. There's also roundover bits. I think an eighth and a three eighths are two good ones to have in the shop. We'll talk about the difference in a minute. I personally love a dovetail bit because I make jigs with those, like my tapering and jointing jig and my cross cut slit. These are just handy to have. Flush trim bits are some of the most used common bits in most shops. What a flush trim does is create two identical pieces. Because that ball bearing rides on the sample piece or the template piece, then you can use those on templates as well as just cleaning up the edge of work. 
Now template cutting with these bearings lets you do several things. You can use jigs like this to create radiuses on the edges of boards using that flush trim, or you can go ahead and make the same thing over and over. So if you're just making charcuterie boards, you can just use a template to do that and make the same pattern over and over again. One of the great things about flush trim bit. And then straight bits help you do different various tasks like cutting the dados or the grooves in this top where I put the T-track in or cutting slots and things like that in boards. Straight bits are awesome for that. Most all of your routers are gonna have some type of adjustment. This is a fixed base router and the way it adjusts the height is this ring twist up and down and it allows you to kind of micro adjust that. Different routers are gonna work different ways. Like this Milwaukee, it has this little thumb knob that is gear driven and it allows it to raise and lower the bit. When you're setting up your edge profile bits like your roundovers and your chamfers, the way I like to set mine up is you see how the bit is sticking all the way past this base. Then I just use this ring or the dial just to dial that up until you no longer see the flat edge of that bit right there. Once that's past the base, you can lock that in and make your cut. Should come out nice and clean. I always recommend using, especially if you're a beginner, just use a scrap piece to make sure that's gonna come out correctly. What happens if it's not set correctly, if it's in other words, sticking past the base too much, you're gonna wind up getting that nice little flat edge there and it's not gonna look that great, unless that's the look you're going for. If you wanted a nice clean look, like this chamfer bit is set correctly here on the right. It's incorrect on the left. You can see that ledge. This is a nice smooth edge. Same thing's gonna happen with a roundover bit. It's gonna create that ledge. Sometimes you want that look depending on what you're doing, but for the most part, you don't. Now the difference between an eighth and a three eighths inch roundover is subtle, but it is useful in certain situations. Like this guitar tray we make here at 731. This bottom edge is a three eighths inch roundover. This top edge is a three eighths inch roundover. However, the inside edge is a one eighth inch roundover. It may be hard to see on video, it is subtle, but there is a difference there. 3 eighths is just a little bit more of a round over radius than an eighth, but it is useful for in various applications, depending on how much round over you want. Hey, it's Future Outlaw. Past Outlaw was wrong and I'm here to correct him. I told you that the, this was a 3 eighths and this was an eighth inch round over. That is incorrect and I'm here to fix myself. What these are are eighth and 1 16th inch bits. You can see the kind of a minor difference there. And this is a 1 eighth and a 1 16th inch roundover. A 3 eighths inch roundover is much more significant than the 1 eighth as you can see here. Back to past outlaw. Now when installing your router bit, what I like to do is leave about a quarter inch or a little, maybe quarter to a half inch sticking out of the router itself. And then when you tighten that down, some of these routers have a push button that locks this in place. Then you can take the wrench and loosen and tighten that nut. Some routers use two wrenches, one to hold this spinny thing from moving and another to loosen and tighten the nut. Router bits usually come in two different sizes, quarter inch and half inch shank. Now it depends on which router you have as to which one of these options you will pick. Now if you have a half inch, I recommend getting half inch bits anytime you can, but a lot of these trim routers only accept quarter inch and not half. However, similar to this DeWalt, it has a both a half and a quarter inch collet is what they call where it accepts the bit is the collet. They have both half and quarter inch, so you can use either. Now when selecting router bits to your shop, it depends on the budget you have. My personal favorite is Whiteside. I buy those bits myself and use them all the time. They last a long time. They're well made with high quality materials. This is a nice set for about a hundred bucks and these last a very long time. I use them all the time. That is a very good beginner set for most people. Now, before I get into the accessories, I think they're very useful to have with routers. Let's talk about what router is best for you and your shop. First and foremost, if you're in a battery platform, it's very convenient to go ahead and pick up the router of your choice. For most beginners, if you're on a budget and you just need a router because you want to put roundovers, chamfers, edge profiles on your work, this little Makita one horsepower Colt is an awesome little router. It's variable speed, has good power to it. It's gonna last you a long time. I love this little router. However, if you're already in a battery platform, a good trim or palm router in that platform is going to be what you wanna look for. Just make sure you get the brushless line and that it's variable speed. Brushless motors on these cordless tools will give you more battery life and more power. By far, my number one pick for most woodworkers starting out is something like this DeWalt. If you have about a $200 budget, you get a plunge and a fixed base, and it's a very powerful router that's gonna do most anything you're gonna to want to do with the router. It's a little bit bigger, so edge profiles aren't as easy to do with a trim router, but it will still do them and do them well. There's also a Bosch model that's under $200 for the most part that has both the plunge and the fixed. I used it in my router table. It's about the same horsepower. I think these are both two and a quarter horsepower. They're both excellent routers 
and will last you for years to come. Either one of those, depending on your color choice or brand choice, would work great for you. I'll link to both of those in the description and the pinned comment so you can find them easier. Now, why would you want a router table in your shop? Well, a router table opens up a whole new world of things you can do with the router. This is a skill router and router table combo recently reviewed on the channel. You can go check that video out. I'll link it up there, I think. You can go check that out after this video. This is a really nice router table for beginners, about $200 or under, depending on the sale. A few things a router table allows you to do. Number one, small parts like these boxes, trays, things like that are much easier to put that edge profile on there because you got that flat surface to work on. You're going to get a nice, consistent round over or edge profile on cutting boards, any kind of boards or anything you're making like that, picture frames, stuff like that. It's a really nice way to do that. You can also set up stop blocks for different things like making grooves or slots in wood like you see here. It's just a really nice way to do things. Or you can just cut 90 degree grooves across boards using a little push stick or a miter gauge or anything like that. Also cutting out templates and things are much easier on the router table. You also get better dust collection on the router table versus what you get on a handheld router. All in all, if you have the budget for a nice router table and router combo, these are nice to have. I'm going to show you five tips to instantly improve your wood finish on your projects, specifically on pine projects like most of us use starting out. There's certain things you need to do to make sure you get that flawless finish. I recently built this table. It's all out of pine uh, from Home Depot. Most of all of my projects that I made on the channel have been out of pine. I built hundreds of these projects over the years from stove covers to tables and I've learned some valuable lessons on what not to do. And today I'm gonna to share with you those five tips. Let's go. Before I show you how to finish this table, if you want to build one just like it, I have plans available for this and many other things on our website. Go to 731woodworks.com store and check those out. If you use the code FINISH, I'll give you 20% off any order, including these little table plans. And if you're interested in any of the supplies or tools you see used today, I'll put links in the description and the pinned comment so you can go check them out for yourself. Number one, you absolutely have to make sure all of the wood glue is properly cleaned up. And we're gonna show you how to do that. But I'm gonna leave some of mine on there to show you what happens if you don't. So during assembly of the table, you may see uh, glue squeeze out or something like that. You can see it here, but on sometimes, depending on the color of the glue and the species of wood, you may not see that squeeze out. But anytime you use wood glue and there's a joint, then you need to make sure that that's properly cleaned up. It's easier to clean up during assembly. Just take a damp cloth and wipe that off, and that will pretty much get rid of all the glue. And then also when you're sanding, you're gonna make sure that you get those spots. Another caution is sometimes you get wood glue on your finger and you hold the piece of wood and whenever you go to stain or put your finish on, that's when you see it. A lot of times you don't see it before then and that's when your heart just sinks. Just for demonstrations, I did put a little wood glue on my thumb and touch the side of the tabletop just to show you what it's gonna look like after we finish this. You're gonna see how that changes things when you put your finish on. Tip number two, if you want to make this look very professional, like you absolutely knew what you were doing, is fill the knot holes and the voids in the wood before you sand it. This is really easy and it's specifically made easy because of company like Starbond. They have CA glues, which are basically colored glues that dry extremely fast. Now I've used them in a ton of projects before. I've even made a couple of specific videos on how to use them. But I'm gonna show you really quick how easy it is and why you should do it. When picking out the color that you're gonna fill these knot holes, you need to know what color you're going to be staining with. Now I know that I'm gonna be staining with dark walnut for the top, but if you're picking a lighter color, you may wanna go with a lighter colored CA glue. Or if you're just gonna be painting this, it really doesn't matter if it's clear or black or anything like that. The darker the color, the darker the wood glue. It'll make it blend and look more natural. This stuff is very affordable and very easy to use. We got a knot hole there. You can feel the uh, crevice in there or the void. And all we're gonna do is squeeze that into that void. I like the medium thick for these purposes. It's not too thin, not too thick. Goldilocks, just right. Just gonna put a little dab on there. And then you'll also get some activator and you'll spray that activator on there. And that's just gonna make that dry within about 30 seconds. We have several of these knot holes up here that we're just gonna do the same thing. This one actually goes all the way around it. So we'll just apply the CA glue around the knot. Now, one of the main reasons you wanna do that is to prevent that knot from working its way out later. I have seen that happen. You finish the project and that knot hole is actually loose and you don't know it and then it pops out. You don't want that happening on your customer or on your project. So go ahead and this is gonna seal those in. A little bit of this stuff goes a very long way. I'll drop a link in the description below to my favorites. 
Another good reason to fill knot holes is to prevent that from splitting as it ages. You can see that one has split in three different directions. This will just bind all that together and keep it from splitting out later. Number three on the list is sanding. Nobody likes sanding for the most part, but it's an essential step to get that perfect flawless finish. We put that CA glue on there. We're gonna make sure that's nice and smooth for the most part on sanding. When you sand things, don't put too much pressure down on your sander because that will create those swirl marks that we all hate. And just make sure that you get all your saw marks and things like that off of there. If you don't, you'll see them, especially if you're staining, you'll see those saw marks left in the edges of your wood. On the edges of your wood, if you hit that with a regular sander, it's gonna deform that, especially if you've used roundovers. So I highly recommend using like a contour pad. This is the one I use, and it just basically forms around the edge of that profile so it doesn't damage it. It just sands it smooth. What I like to do after I get through sanding with my orbital sander is I'll take something like this sanding mouse and go with the grain uh, just to give it a final sand at 220. I always sand with the orbital sander at 120. I rarely go above 120 on furniture pieces. But on the sanding block, I'll put a piece of 220 grit on there and just sand with the grain on all the surfaces. That just helps remove any of those sanding marks that may have been there. But if you use like an 80 grit, 60 grit, something like that, that's gonna put a lot of deep scratches, especially in softwoods like pine. That's why I highly recommend staying at 120 grit or above. Another thing you wanna be sure and look for are clamping marks. In other words, where you've clamped the boards down, you may see where your F clamps have indented the wood a little bit or any type of clamp you're using really, you'll see that circle or those half circles. You wanna make sure that you get those sanded off because if you don't, they'll absolutely show up in the stain, which I'll show you in a little bit. After you get through sanding, you absolutely wanna make sure to just take your shop back or whatever and vacuum up any of the bigger loose dust you can get. And then I highly recommend a microfiber cloth like these are very inexpensive and they remove a lot of the dust that you can't see and you will not remove if you just move your hand or a vacuum across the surface. You can see here, how much dust came up just from the top. We'll wipe the whole surface down before we move on to step number four. If you skip this part and if you don't remove the dust, especially from the top, when you put your finish on, that dust will get embedded into there and it'll be very difficult to get off later. In other words, when people touch the top of your product or your surface of your table, they'll feel that bumpy, gritty feeling. You don't want that. Step number four, before you stain it, you wanna wipe everything down with mineral spirits. This is also gonna remove some of that dust from the previous step, but it's also gonna reveal some things to you. A lot of times if you wipe this down, you'll see where you've got sanding marks, so swirl marks, and where you've left the glue, like you see here. This is 4B. This is still part of the staining process and essential on softwoods in my opinion. I've stained dozens of projects without this stuff and hundreds of projects with this pre-stained conditioner from Minwax and this stuff works. Some people say this uh, mineral spirits and this are the same thing, but I just disagree. What this will do is remove the blotchiness or the miscolorations in wood. A lot of times when you stain pine, you'll see some really nasty looking dark spots and things like that. This helps prevent that. It's a good idea here to put some gloves on. This is very simple to apply. You're just going to take a terry cloth and dampen it and wipe the entire project down. And this will take about 30 or 45 minutes to dry after you wipe it on. And then we'll move on to 4C, staining. And 4C, I think is where we're at. Uh, we're just gonna put stain on. There's no magic secret to putting stain on. I do recommend uh, the best applicator for stain, in my opinion, are old t-shirts, like old white t-shirts, like undershirts, because they don't have any lint, things like that. A terry cloth also works well, which I'm using here. The only thing to be cautious with on terry cloths is sometimes they will kind of snag in any splinter that may be there. When applying stain to the underside where you have pocket holes, like in this project, the good old fashioned Q-tip, AKA cotton swab if you don't use Q-tip brand, you'll just dip it into the stain and then run it into the pocket hole. This is by far the easiest way to stain inside pocket holes. And I recommend putting stain in there. One, it helps seal it but most importantly, it makes it look better to your customer if they ever look underneath the piece of furniture. That way it's just not an unstained piece there. As far as applying stain go, I always like to put it on the underside first and then the top side. And then you'll wanna let your stain dry about 24 hours before we move to the next step. Wipe it on fairly liberally. You don't want it pulling up. I think a lot of people make a mistake by putting too much stain on, and that's really not the purpose of stain. It's just to stain the wood, it's not really to flood the wood. It's not like an oil finish where you're uh, dipping a uh, cutting board or something like that into mineral oil and it's soaking into the grain for a period of time. That's not what stain is for. Stain is just to color the wood to the color you want. It's basically painting it, but 
not. And you may notice some dark splotches here, and that's what you'll see when you don't use pre-stain. Once I get it coated, I'll take a clean part of the rag and just wipe lightly any excess, and then we'll move on to the edges before we flip it over. I like these little Craig blocks because they have these little rubber nibs on there, and that prevents this from sliding around while I'm trying to stain something like this. Anytime you have a crack or a gap, you want to put a little extra in there and let that finish soak into that just so that it all colors it up right. Now this is extremely important, extremely important. Listen, do not throw this in a trash can or in the corner of your shop or anything like this. These uh, can actually self combust in the right condition. So make sure to dispose of these properly. What I like to do is take an old stain rag. I set it away from the house outdoors for a couple of days and then I discard it in the outdoor trash can. I do not put these in the trash can in my house or in the shop or just leave them laying around. Never do that with stained or oily rags. Now we just applied the stain to the top and we have a problem. Remember, I talked about sanding marks as well as glue marks. This is where you will see those. I bared down on the sander on purpose to show you what will happen if you push down too much pressure and you don't sand that off with that sanding block. You can see those little swirlies. That's from the sander as well as on the same edge I did the same thing and you can see those swirlies there. And while that's not a huge deal, it will hurt your feelings, especially if it's on a large project and you have a bunch of them. If you remember where I put my thumb in the glue and to accidentally touch the top, then you're gonna see that come out in a lighter spot in your stain. If you see this on any of your project where there's a light spot, that's wood glue. And that's what, the wood glue has already filled the pores of that wood and the stain couldn't soak in there. So you're gonna see that lighter spot and that's going to really hurt your feelings. Now you can fix that, but you have to sand off the stain off of that edge or wherever that glue spot is if it's on the top. You have to sand that back off. If it's on the top, pretty much you have to sand a large area because you want everything to mix and blend back together. So in this case, this tabletop here, if I had a glue spot on top, I would sand the whole thing back off and repeat the whole staining process. For the edge, you can just sand this edge, then stain it again. When staining or painting the base, always turn it upside down and paint and or stain the bottom side, then we flip it over and do the top side. It's much easier that way. Now I've applied this lighter color stain to the base and I can already see the flaws because the stain will highlight anything you've done wrong. There is a clamp mark, there is a clamp mark. You can also see the swirlies right there. And then if you'll take notice of the back side of these, I did not apply pre-stain conditioner. They're much darker and more blotchy than the front side. And now you can really see those saw marks that I was pointing out earlier. They were difficult to see before the stain was applied, but now that the stain is applied, you can clearly see them. And a couple of places that the glue wasn't cleaned up on purpose again, you can see right there that very light spot. Also, you might can see it right there along that crease or along that seam, but it really is pronounced here. Uh, you just, the, the color isn't taking to the wood the same as the surrounding areas because that glue's blocking it. And that's why it's so important. That's one of the main things that you have to do and have to look for when building stuff like this is just to clean up those edges. Again, a damp cloth, after you put everything together, just wipe it in that crease, it'll take care of it. You don't have to worry about it after that. But if you don't clean it up, or if you get some on your thumb and touch the project, then it's gonna show up. Another thing you may notice are these horizontal lines that run down uh, boards like this. That's the face of the board. Even on these raw tuba sixes, I, that's what I used to build that. You can see those vertical or those lines on this one. I'm not sure how much it's showing up on camera, but you can see those there. That's where it was planed at the factory. And if you don't sand it, then it'll show up in your finish. Typically what I like to do is just spray the bottom first, and that's gonna include the inside of all those legs and everything that I can get from this angle. And then after that dries, it only takes lacquer probably five or 10 minutes to dry before you can touch it. And then I'll flip it over and do the top side. And we're gonna put about three coats of lacquer on there. The reason I like lacquer is because each coat bonds to the coat that you previously put on there and it creates a very hard and durable surface. I used lacquer on my desk build that I did a while back and it has held up extremely well, even using a mouse on there without a mouse pad. So that has wore very well. For a long time, I used to use polyurethane, specifically water-based polyurethane over oil-based stains. Yes, you can do that and it doesn't hurt anything. So long as the stain cures about 24 hours. However, it takes longer for it to cure between coats and it's a little harder to get a flawless finish like you can with lacquer. Lacquer is my favorite go-to finish of any finish that you can use on furniture, especially tabletops and things like that because it's so durable and for a beginner it's very easy to apply. All you have to do is spray it on. 
Now, I like using these rattle cans for small projects, but I have used an HVLP gun with a little bit of lacquer mixed with lacquer thinner. I've got a video on that I'll, on my desk build. I'll link in the description as well as a link to the polyurethane video if you like using that. So I like to put two coats of lacquer on and I'm waiting about 30 minutes between each coat. And then before I put the final coat on, I'm gonna take 320 grit sandpaper very lightly sand the top of this and just remove any bumps or anything that you may feel in that and then we're going to wipe that down with a microfiber cloth and then we're going to spray our final coat of lacquer this stuff is so easy to apply anybody can do it what you never want to do is spray lacquer in an enclosed environment such as a garage which is why you see me outside fumes will come off of this thing and it makes it very difficult to breathe and it's quite dangerous actually so don't breathe this stuff in without a respirator if you're going to spray it inside i prefer to bring everything outside to spray it. a couple of quick tips on lacquer is you don't want to spray too heavy in other words don't make it pull up or drip now, all you're doing is putting a very light coat i used to hold the can about six or eight inches away and then just make equal passes or even passes on there super easy to do and it'll come out nice and flawless just don't stop and cause a puddle also, I'm using satin here. You can get gloss, but I prefer the satin. It just looks more natural. After the final coat, I let that dry for about 30 minutes before I bring it back inside. At that point, as long as the temperature is above 50 degrees, it should be dry. And you'll be able to tell if it's tacky or damp feeling or even sticky feeling. If it's not, then it's dry and ready to come in. Now wait about 24 hours before you set anything on top of that, like a cup or a, a lamp or a plant or whatever you built this table for. Overall, the table looks fairly nice, even with the on-purpose mistakes that I put into this to show you what not to do. However, if you take the time and do it properly, it'll look that much better, which will command a higher price and make your projects look more professional. First mistake you should avoid is cutting dangerous angles. So for instance, my miter saw only goes to 50 inches one way and 60 inches the other way, but I need to make a 65 degree cut. How can we do that safely? So the wrong way to do this is you would lay out the mark for 65 degrees and then you would line it up with your blade as you see here. And then you'll try to hold this steady to make the cut. That's extremely dangerous. One, you, it just, you can't hold that steel. And two, it's just, it could pull the board and, and or your hand into that blade. We don't want that. First thing I'm gonna do is cut a two by six down about the same width of my table or the base of my saw. Next, we're gonna use some double stick tape. It doesn't really matter which kind. I'll link to in the description to some of my favorite. But the main thing is you wanna make sure you tape on either side and not on the side that pivots. Pivot! <laughs> You wanna make sure this board is flat and not rocking because if it's rocking, it's not gonna stick properly. Make sure you got a good flat board and then you're just gonna push it against the fence and set it straight down. It should be stuck with that double stick tape. Now we're gonna cut 45 degrees in both directions and then remove that center piece. So now what we've done is we've made this, instead of zero, it's actually 45 degrees. I've got these two pieces acting as a fence now. So now if I made a cut on zero, it'd actually be 45 degrees. So to get to 65 degrees, we're just gonna need to add 20 degrees. So all I have to do is move this to 20, lock that down and make the cut and this will be 65 degrees. And now we have a 65, it's a very large angle, 65 degree angle, safely cut on the miter saw using our new jig. And when you're done, simply remove the double stick tape and your miter saw is back to normal without any damage. Now where I found this useful is I was making a coffee table with an X brace feature in each side. Because of the size of that opening, that angle was gonna be way more than what my miter saw could do. So this is how I corrected that, cutting those four before's on the exact right angle. It's a handy little trick. The next mistake that most beginners make, and I made it too, was keeping the stock blade that come on your miter saw. That is meant for rough construction. That's what those blades are for. They're typically about 32 teeth blades, and they just aren't great for woodworking and making like cutting boards or furniture, etc. So replace that blade. I like the CMT 80 tooth blade. This is the CMT Orange Chrome. This blade is about $100, but it lasts a very, very, very long time. It stays sharp a long time and it cuts super clean. There are other budget options out there that won't cost you as much. I like the Diablo line of blades. I have run the 80 tooth there. I like the 80 tooth on a miter saw because you're making cross cuts, in other words, across the grain, and this prevents more tear out, etc. It just makes a better, cleaner cut, in my opinion, and that's one of the first things I think you should upgrade. The next mistake that most beginners make when they first get their saw, or even intermediates, or even professionals, I made this mistake 
early in this video, I just didn't tell you until now, is checking this saw for square. I let a friend borrow the square, and just because it was transported to and from, you should always check the square. First things first, make sure it does not have power, no matter if you're using a cordless or a corded saw. Unplug it or take the batteries out. Make sure that the blade is square to your fence. And the way you do that is you just take a simple square and line it up. If this is not square, you have problems you need to correct, and they're easy to correct. What you want to avoid, though, is you want to make sure that the blade of your square does not hit those teeth that stick out, or that will cause an inaccuracy. Check that for square. If everything looks good, great. If not, you can adjust that. Uh, check out your owner's manual. I'm sure you've already read that. But most saws have an adjustment. You can line that up on zero, and then you can loosen these bolts off and move this plate around if you need to do adjust where zero's at, because there is a hard stop at zero on almost all miter saws. And then you're just gonna check the 90 on straight up and down. Again, we want to avoid those teeth, so make sure you get between the teeth of that blade so that you get a nice, accurate reading. The next mistake most beginners make when they're using the miter saw is they don't have some type of dust protection. That can come in a variety of different ways. The easiest and most budget-friendly way is just to pick up a good quality dust mask. I've used and recommended RZ Mask for years. Uh, this is their new M3 model. I like the M2 as well. M3 has a couple extra straps, but I prefer the M2 because it's a one-strap thing. It's just more comfortable in my opinion. You can also get some type of dust collection via a shop vac or even a dust extractor. I use the Festool CT36 on my miter saw. It works extremely well. Good air volume coming through there and that's what you're looking for. So if you're getting a shop vac for your miter saw, try to get the one that has the most horsepower motor. It's gonna pull the most air flow through there. Uh, that's gonna help tremendously on dust collection. Last thing you want is a face full of dust. Uh, some miter saws are worse than others. There's a lot of aftermarket fittings out there to help improve the dust collection. And one thing I think most beginners don't think about is they use the mask while they're cutting and then the air gets full of dust and then you take the dust mask off and you start assembling your stuff you're still breathing the dust so it's probably best to leave this on or get some type of dust collection uh, in your shop if you can but at a minimum get a dust mask that's going to help out a lot and then if you can get a shop vac or a dust extractor that's going to really improve things the next mistake that i see a lot of beginners make is crossing their arms let me show you I've been very guilty of this myself. A lot of times you'll see somebody grab, especially if they're right-handed, they'll grab the board with the right hand on the left side of the blade, and then they will actually make the cut coming down like this. This puts your arm in a very, very bad spot for that blade, especially if you get some type of kickback or anything like that. This is a big, 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 big no-no. You wanna make sure you're holding on the right side, and most people will hold on the left while they operate the saw on the right if you're right-handed or vice versa if you're left-handed but don't cross your arms. The next mistake you wanna avoid is loose or long sleeve baggy clothing around this blade. Obviously your arm shouldn't be that close to the blade. However, I have seen people get the sleeve hung in the blade and get it pulled into the blade, causing some really, really bad injuries to that forearm or even the hand area. So make sure if you are wearing long sleeves that they're not baggy, especially if you're on a job site and you're wearing like a big thick coat, something like that, you do want to avoid that. If you're in the shop, Long sleeves are okay, just make sure that you have, they're not very, very baggy and make sure they stay away from that blade. The next mistake I see beginners make and I've made myself is cutting very small pieces on the miter saw. It is absolutely not meant for that. The reason being is there's a certain gap that's going to be between these two fences. And if the piece is small enough, it could get actually pulled around by the blade causing a kickback. I broke my thumb because of that. I was just being dumb. I didn't know any better. I didn't know better. I just, I had that gut feeling, don't do this, and I did it anyway. And that's one of those things you should always, power tip for you, always listen to your gut. If it don't feel right in the gut, don't make the cut, right? So I didn't listen to myself and I cut that tiny piece and it caused a kickback. A miter saw is not meant to make those small, small cuts. However, you can do so safer if you build something like this jig that sits on top of the miter saw and literally just creates a zero clearance on the backside and the bottom of these pieces. And then you can use something like the $10 million stick to hold that piece in place while you're making a cut and your hands are safely out of the way. That's the best way to cut small parts on the miter saw. But I've seen this mistake and I've made it myself, so I know we're doing it. So. Now there's a right way and a wrong way to make a cut on a miter saw. First and foremost, you never just power it on and then this, like as soon as you pull the trigger, start plunging, it's gonna plunge, it's gonna have a harder time cutting. Uh, you're just cutting too fast. You gotta let this thing speed up or spin up. Now what I like to do is just turn the miter saw on and let it get to full speed and then ease it down through the cut. You're not in that big a hurry. Once you're all the way through the cut, 
let that blade stop before you raise the saw back up. If you raise it up too fast, it could cause some type of kickback and it just makes your cuts look crappy. So let it come up to speed, ease it into it, and then let it stop. Another mistake I see is if you're using a stop block system, what happens is you put that board up against the stop block and then you make the cut. That board is essentially trapped between the blade and the stop block at that point. If you raise the saw back up while it's still spinning, this could cause a little bit of a kickback there and you wanna avoid that. So again, let that thing stop, no matter if you're using the stop block or not, but especially if you're using a stop block because it can get jammed up in there and either damage your stop block or make up for a bad day on a kickback. And another mistake I see, and I've made myself, <laughs> is make sure you have material support on each side of your miter saw, whether that be with a miter station or some type of miter stand or rolling stands, any way to support that to keep it from falling because if you make the cut, and there's not enough support on either side, it's going to fall like this. And then you, you know, that just jams things up and could cause an accident. So just make sure you keep those supported. If you're in a shop setting, a miter station is a great option if you have the dedicated space for it. If not, you can get rolling miter stands, all kinds of things to help you support that material. Another mistake most beginners make and most don't even pay attention to is this throat plate on the bottom. What that is for is so that it's supporting that material as it's being cut. This one and most any that I've seen have slotted holes here. You can loosen these bolts off and move these in and out and that's gonna give you a kind of a zero clearance like feel or results. However, there is this tape called Fast Cap Zero Clearance Tape. It's a really durable vinyl material that you're gonna put on there. It's easy to put on, it's easy to take off and you're gonna cut a slot in there. Now, a lot of people will I've seen in the comments say that this will throw off your cuts and it can if this throat plate is setting up high enough. You can take a straight edge and lay across here and see how much it's going to throw it off. Sometimes it's like a thousandth of an inch. So it just depends on what type of work you're doing is if that's gonna matter. I haven't had any issues with it. I've had it on this saw on and off for years, five, six years, zero, zero issues. If you have something like the Festool Capex, they make an insert. There's a company called Cauliflower that makes an insert for it. It's some type of plastic material that you just put in there and cut. Of course, if you make any bevel cuts on either one of these, then that's where you're gonna damage it and you have to replace it. But this really does help keeping those small pieces from falling down in there and it gives you a much cleaner, cleaner cut on the bottom side. Even though some people call it a myth, uh, call it true because I've seen it and proved it. Another mistake I see beginners make and I've almost done it, almost done it myself is on almost all miter saws, the top of the fence can move in and out. And what that's for is so you can have more support closer to the blade. And another reason it slides in and out is so when you make bevel cuts, you don't cut that aluminum fence and you can absolutely hit that fence. If you're making a bevel cut and you haven't adjusted that fence properly, what's going to happen is when you go to cut, you're absolutely going to run into that aluminum fence and damage a blade and cut your saw's fence up. It's happened to a lot of people and it's something that you really have to be paying attention to before you make that cut. And remember, when you put it back at zero, check the square. When you first get into woodworking, it's very confusing on which miter saw to pick for you and your shop because there's so many options out there. Literally, almost every tool company has an option. My favorite, that is like the workhorse, is this DeWalt DWS 779. There's another model called a 780 uh, that looks identical to this, but it adds a shadow line to your cut, uh, if that matters to you. But these are excellent saws, but their downfall is they have this big old rail system that slides off the back and you can't get it close to the wall. For my shop, space saving is massive. I need all the space saving I can get, which is why I decided to go with the Festool. The rails come forward on the Festool, but there's other options out there as well, like the Delta Cruiser has those articulating arms and it can be mounted flush against the wall. The Makita miter saw is also another good option, although expensive, like the Festool. Both the Festool and Makita are way up in the upper price range. This is a solid pick, I think, for most people. I think this is the best miter saw for most people if you don't need that space saving design. But if you do need that space saving design, you can check out Bosch. They have an articulating arm one, the Delta, and a few others that I'll link in the description. 
Another thing beginners struggle with on miter saws is dust collection, as we briefly mentioned earlier. I'll give a couple of options for you. Obviously, the strong shop vac, uh, like a rigid, I think they make it like a six and a half horsepower uh, shop vac that you can use, pulls a lot of volume through there. Uh, I like the Festool dust extractors, but you could also check out Bosch dust extractors, or even DeWalt makes a dust extractor that I ran with this saw for years that worked extremely well. All have HEPA filters, meaning it's gonna keep those fine particles out of the air, but the key is collecting it at the source. So a good, strong dust extractor or vac really works well. Here's a bonus mistake that I see some beginners make, and that's not making sure that when they build their miter station that it's perfectly flat with the top side of the bed of the miter saw. And what that's gonna do is really help keep things accurate and just all around make things more useful. Nothing's falling or even moving when you're cutting. So it's just a good, good option. You can see here that I shimmed this up with some hardwood shims and because they were still slightly off, there's a couple of washers in there to help raise them up. That's Southern for washers. But that gets everything nice and flat perfectly all the way across. So when I'm moving the boards across, there is no movement on that board. And when I cut it, more importantly, nothing moves, falls, anything like that. I designed this miter station to be compact because I'm in a garage and I need to save space. This miter station is only six foot long, about two foot deep. So it's very, very compact, but it does have an extension wing if I need to cut larger items. If you'd like to check it out, I'll put plans in the description. These are the woodworking clamps you'll actually use in your shop, but there's some of these I wish I had never bought, and some of these I wish I had bought sooner. This is the beginner's guide to woodworking clamps. Now, over the years, I went through a bunch of different styles of clamps and which ones worked for me and which ones didn't. I first started, the first clamps I ever bought were these black and red clamps. These are from Walmart, and I bought them for about $3 a piece. I still have like four of them left but the majority of them broke because they were so cheaply made and you just couldn't put any pressure uh, to speak of to hold things together. Now I think these quick clamps or squeeze clamps are some of the first you should buy as a beginner woodworker because uh, for one, they're very inexpensive and for two, they work well for holding things together while you just attach it or you know put a screw through it or just holding things in place till the glue dries. That's why I like them. I highly recommend the Irwin brand. These have held up very well and you can get these a really nice price. Or if you have a little bit bigger budget, the Bessie brand is an extremely good squeeze clamp. These are two of my favorite brands of squeeze clamps. And I think these for beginners are a good budget option. But if you value your money and what they're getting for your price, I would steer clear of these cheaper squeeze clamps. They just don't last and I regret buying them. I'd have been much better off just paying a few extra dollars for the better ones and then not having these constantly break. So there's a couple of extra squeeze clamps that I'll recommend, but not yet. You shouldn't buy those in the beginning, I think. The next clamp you should buy is absolutely the F clamp. This is one of if not the most used clamp in my shop. I've used these thousands of times for various different reasons. I literally used to make glue ups with these, so like panels, table legs, things like that. On these, you just have to put a sacrificial piece in there so that the smaller pieces doesn't make an indention in the wood. Or if it does make the indention, it does it in the scrap piece. There's one brand of F clamps that I don't recommend. And don't hate on me because I'll recommend them later the brand. This is a Harbor Freight F clamp. And the reason I don't like them is when you put pressure on them, the metal on the bar is so thin, not good tensile strength, it just bends. And, and it causes a little bit of an issue with things. Um, it's just not the greatest. Now I know you can get a bunch of those for very cheap, but if you look at something like the Irwin brand again, they're very well made, nice thick bar. They don't bend as easy and by far, my favorite F clamp that I've purchased, and I've purchased several of these now, is the Jorgensen brand F clamp. These are some of the best F clamps made, in my opinion, even above the Bessie brand. I think the Jorgensen brand is just a more robust clamp. Big, thick handle on there, nice, thick bar. If you like thick, Jorgensen's the way to go. After you have the squeeze clamps and the F clamps, the next clamp you should buy, as a beginner, in my opinion, is the bar clamp. Why? Because these are inexpensive for what you're getting and you can do multiple glue ups with them. You can do cutting boards, you can do tabletops, a lot of things to keep that nice flat glue up that you're looking for. A bar clamp is perfect for that. And a lot of people use bar clamps over parallel clamps because of that reason. Now parallel clamps have their place, we'll talk about it, but these are a fantastic way to add a bunch of clamps to your shop for a little bit of money. I have 
several of these. This is Bessie brand. It's the only ones I have as far as bar clamps go, and I recommend them. They've worked extremely well. Basically, the bottom jaw slides, the top jaw screws into the top, and you can get the pipes, the clamps, everything you need on Amazon. I'll link to them in the description. These are really good clamps, and they go on sale quite regularly. This is a good way to stock up on clamps for your shop. All right, the next few clamps I think you should need before you buy parallel clamps because parallel clamps are so expensive, I don't think a beginner needs them right off the bat. You can use other styles to get away with that. One clamp I have been very impressed with, I've used these a bunch and they're, they're very long. Like this is like a 60 inch clamp from Harbor Freight. So I told you I was gonna recommend them. These are really good clamps. Now they're not the strongest clamps because this channel is hollow, but a lot of people just cut a wood strip, stick in there, it makes them much more robust. And now you can use those for a variety of reasons. The reason I like these is because it's very expensive to get very long clamps like this. And so I've got these for the shop and I've used them on a ton of projects. I actually used to use those to glue up my flags when I was making those. To build this workbench, I used those because I had to hook two together. So if you need a lot of clamping area, these from Harbor Freight are fantastic clamps. And I think it's really good to have longer clamps in the shop because there's a lot of times when you're gluing up different projects that are wider or longer, you're gonna need those bigger clamps. Parallel clamps? No, not yet. <laughs> Next, I think, these are not really clamps, but more clamp accessories. And I think every shop should have these if you value your time and your sanity. These are corner clamps or clamping squares or whatever you wanna call them. And these work in it with just any regular either squeeze clamp or F clamps. I use these a lot with F clamps. When you're putting any two pieces together on a 90 degree angle like cabinets, these are lifesavers. You'll, you'll hug my neck next time you see me if you buy these because of this video. I can't believe I went so long without these. I used to try to hold them up and then they would just fall and it would just be frustrating. When you put these together, you clamp one side down, clamp the other side down. Now you've got a perfect 90 degree angle that you can attach your two pieces together, whether that be pocket screws or if you're using other types of joinery. These are so inexpensive and so handy to have in the shop. I've got a whole set here that's got like an extra small, small, medium, and large, and I think these are just a fantastic value for your shop. Now for those squeeze clamps I think you should buy at this point in time, then look at these two. It just depends on the type of work you're doing. These little blue ones are handy as a shirt pocket. Stick them in there, pull it out when you need it. You'll love these little things. I use these all the time to hold things down while I get a measurement or just hold things in place until I get a bigger clamp on there. These are fantastic. And they have this jaw on the inside so you can clamp round stock and all kinds of stuff. These are just really great to have. Now there's another version here that has a band attached to them. I love having these if you put on like face trim or anything like that. This helps just hold that nice and tight till the glue dries if you don't want any nails showing or you just put those on there while you put some pin nails in. These, I'm telling you, if you do any type of face trim or anything like that, you'll love having these in the shop. Parallel clamps, not yet. <laughs> if you do pocket holes, now if you don't do pocket holes, what's wrong with you? Everybody loves pocket holes. <laughs> if you do pocket holes, these two clamps are, again, you're gonna hug my neck. If you've never had a face clamp or a 90 degree pocket hole clamp, these two are absolutely phenomenal, especially the face clamp. Before I got the face clamp, I used to try to use F clamps to hold two pieces flush together. It was a pain in the rear. Once you have these, they have a pivoting head. Pivot. Pivot. They have a pivoting head there that will basically level up two pieces so that they're perfectly flush while you drive the pocket screw. You'll love having one of these and they're not that expensive at all. Just one pair is all you need. You don't need more than that. I've had the same pair for years and they've lasted for a very long time. I highly recommend that Craig brand. Now this one, it's a little more expensive, but if you put two panels together at an angle, at a 90 degree angle, using those corner clamps, then you're gonna love having this because it's gonna keep your two panels from shifting on you while you drive that pocket screw in there. Because it has this nice long 3 8 inch little basically metal dowel that goes into the pocket hole, the other side clamps on the opposite side, keeps everything nice and flush. These are I can't say enough about this clamp. I've had this one for years as well. It's one of the best clamps I've bought. I love this thing. And this thing is so nice to have when you need it. Parallel clamp? No, 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 not yet. This, and besides, there's some of these you don't want to buy and some you do. We'll talk about that. This 
is a dovetail clamp. Now, why would you need a dovetail clamp? I think this is probably one of the most versatile, underrated clamps out there. I've used these on a ton of different things. I love having these on my jointing jig. If you've seen that video where you can joint the edge of boards or, my, or taper boards, using these clamps on that jig, fantastic. And all you need is a dovetail bit in these clamps. They sell them as a pack. And then there you go, you're off to the races. I also use this on my crosscut sled. This is really great for holding small parts while you're cutting or holding things at an angle. Like these are just so nice to have. Also, I made a mini workbench that incorporated these so you could do all sorts of like traditional woodworking stuff with a small workbench if you're in a small shop. I'll link to that right there on that card. You can go watch that video, how to build that if you're in a small space. It's perfect, it's awesome. But these little dovetail clamps are just, they're really nice. I love having these in the shop. I used to think these were old timer clamps. In other words, only old people used them because I saw them in all the old magazines and stuff. And then I got some in the shop. And I think these, before parallel clamps are more important, they're called hand screw clamps. And one of the main uses for them is because these two screws are independent, you can do different angles. So if you needed to clamp something at an angle, you could. Another thing is you can use them for temporary stop blocks on your fence, like your router table. You could also hold small parts with it at the drill press, or you can use them as temporary a setup for a vertical vise on your actual workbench. So these are awesome to have and they're very inexpensive. You can buy these for not a lot of money. Parallel clamps, yes, but we need to talk about clamp storage and we'll do that after the parallel clamps. Now I did a whole video on the best parallel clamp that you could buy and I bought all like different brands. I don't remember how many brands, but there was a bunch of them. And what I thought was the best of the best were the Bessies because of the price. But the Harbor Freight Brennan brand is wildly underrated. This is like $35 for a 24 inch parallel clamp is a super good price. If you're on a budget, you don't mind Harbor Freight stuff, this is a good deal in my opinion. Some people kind of frown on these and as not being very good, but I've had very good luck out of this one, no issues at all. The Bessies are my favorite, the Revo K-Body I believe it is, these are my favorite and because of their just best bang for the buck clamp you can buy, you can get them in different bundles where you get 224s, 231s, uh, 250 inches. I've got several of these that they're just absolutely amazing clamps. I like the jet clamps. I think they're very nice, but they're also very expensive and I don't really recommend those for most people. So why do woodworkers use parallel clamps? Well, the, as the name suggests, uh, these jaws once tightened down are parallel to each other. And where that's very, very useful, cutting boards, tabletops, any panel glue up that you're doing, if those two jaws can remain parallel, that's gonna keep your panel from bowing and twisting and things like that. So a lot of people love these for panel glue ups. In other words, putting more than two pieces of wood together edge to edge. So these are really handy to have for that purpose. So if you're doing a lot of that work, you'll appreciate parallel clamps. And if you're not, then you really don't need them. While they are useful for doing things like cabinets and things because you can hold, again, parallel. Uh, I've used them for that. You could seriously get away with only using uh, these bar type clamps or other types versus parallel clamps and save a lot of money. Before we get to clamp storage, what size do you need? Well, it just depends on what you're making, right? So if you're making a lot of cutting boards, then a 24, probably a 36 inch clamp, like this 36 inch bar clamp, will be perfectly fine. When you start making tabletops, things like that, you're gonna wanna get bigger clamps, longer clamps, but there's a lot of different versions. This is a 24 inch parallel clamp. They have 31 inch, they have 50 inch. So it just depends on what you're making. On the F clamps, a lot of times I prefer the 36 inch, but it's always nice to have some smaller versions as well. I have this small set of Bessies you see here on this rack. I use these all the time to hold small parts. Having a good variety is nice, but if you only have the budget starting out for one size, 36 inch seems to be kind of the best middle ground. Now when you first start out, you're only gonna have a few clamps and you're not really gonna to have to worry about storage, but I like them, I love them, I want some more of them. That's kind of how we think about clamps as woodworkers. So uh, you have to figure out a way to store these. Now you can do it a bunch of different ways. There's literally hundreds of ways to store them. And I've come up with a few that worked well in my shop. First and foremost, I just made some out of plywood. Now these for these small F clamps like you see here, you're just gonna cut slots in them that'll fit right through there. It works perfectly fine. You could literally do that for any of the clamps. And then I also have these from Rockler that are just made for specific style clamps. So these are made for the parallel clamps. There's a set made for the bar clamps and there's a set made for the F style clamps. I like these because A, they're not very expensive. 
I didn't have to make them, but I'm lazy. They're cheap, easy, and you just screw them into a solid wall and then you can just store your clamps. Time saver, basically. Then also my mobile tool cart, I was able just to incorporate some clamp racks in that just so that I would have clamps handy on the tool cart. So you see there's a variety of ways to store clamps in your shop depending on how you use them. I even have some stored under this toolbox. Everybody knows that a miter saw is one of the messiest dust producing machines that you have in the shop, but you can fix that pretty easily. I bought this kit from Shop Nation. He's a fellow YouTuber and he didn't know I was gonna buy this or do a video on it, but I did want to upgrade this dust collection system on this DeWalt miter saw. It was really easy to put on. It take the old pieces off, put this on, and it does improve the dust collection. Before I had this, I did several test cuts on pine as well as MDL. It had dust going pretty much everywhere. But when I put this new system on, you can see how much it basically pulls it and directs it right into the pipe where it gets sucked out of there. I'm using a Festool dust extractor for this, but it does have the adapters to help you get set up with a regular shop vac or any other dust extractor you may have. This worked extremely well. Now it's still not perfect. You're still not getting perfect 100% dust collection, but it is significantly improved from the stock. And he has these available for multiple models of miter saws, pretty much any one that you might have. Bosch, DeWalt, Rigid, not Festool. Come on, Travis, need that Festool. The number two way you can improve your miter saw is to add zero clearance to the throat plate. Now there's a couple of ways to do this. You can build your own throat plate. What I've liked and used on this DeWalt is for years, I've used this stuff. This is a fast cap zero clearance tape. It's like a vinyl tape that has a really sticky back. It's easily removable when you want to change it out, but it's also easily put on. You just stick it on and cut and now you've got a zero clearance. This produces a much cleaner cut on the bottom side of the cut than if you're just using the standard throat plate because that throat plate is wide. It has a very wide opening and that leaves room for little bits and pieces to fall down in there and you have a lot more tear out with those. Now, if you have a Festool Capex, you can do the same thing, but with an actual physical insert. This is UHMW plastic stuff that inserts in there. You can change these out easily as well. And they do come with five in the package, so you'll have several to use, whether you're doing bevel cuts or straight cuts or just something like mine. It just gets damaged over time. The number three way to improve your miter saw is the blade. It sounds simple, but if you're still using the stock blade and you're doing woodworking, not rough construction, take the blade that come with it off because typically those are like 32 teeth and they cut really rough. That's what they're made for, rough construction, fast cuts. You wanna get something like an 80 tooth. I use this 82 CMT Chrome blade. It's a 12 inch saw, 12 inch blade. This is a fantastic blade and they stay sharp a very long time. They create a very smooth, very nice clean cut you're gonna see a major, major improvement if you just upgrade your blades. Again, I like to hire tooth blade for woodworking because 99% of the time we're doing cross cuts. And if you're doing a lot of cross cutting, a higher tooth blade will produce less tear out, in other words, a cleaner cut. There are other options available to you, but I think CMT is one of the better blades I've used and I've kept CMT blades on this saw for years. Next up, you can improve your miter saw's cuts cleanliness as well as safety with this little jig that you can build. This is super simple. All I'm doing is taking some MDF and making a miter sled. Now I'm gonna build this sled to fit my Festool Capex because that's the one I use most of the time, but you can certainly build one for any miter saw. Let me show you how to do it. I'm just gonna use some MDF. You can use plywood, whatever you want. This is half inch thick, I think, so it's plenty thick enough. I'm gonna cut one piece that's gonna fit on the base of the saw, one piece that's gonna fit on the back, AKA the fence. Now I'm gonna rip this to four inches. This is the height of my fence, but you can rip it however you want. Once I have my pieces cut out, I'm just gonna lay the base on the miter saw. I've got two half inch by half inch by about five or six inch long pieces. I'm just gonna CA glue those to the bottom, right where the saw is has the natural ledges. This is gonna let me put that base on every time exactly the same place, so it's always square. Once that's glued on, I'm just gonna put the fence on the same way, a little CA glue and activator. You can always reinforce this with screws if you want. Then you're just gonna set the depth setting on your miter saw. Make sure you set the depth setting or you're gonna cut your piece in half. You don't wanna do that. I'm just gonna cut about an eighth inch deep in this material. That way I've got a zero clearance on the bottom. It's gonna give me a zero clearance on the back. I'm gonna do 45 on each side but that will notch out the back fence so you can add a little faux fence down below. That'll solve that issue. That's it. Now you're able to cut small parts and without tear out on longer parts. 
because we use these little lock bars on each side, it's gonna lock it right into the side of your miter saw. It doesn't matter which one you have. It's gonna slide on there and be perfectly square every time, and it's not gonna shift left and right. That's gonna give you a perfectly clear line exactly where you're gonna to have to cut every time. You know where that blade's gonna go, and it's gonna give you a much, much cleaner cut because you have zero clearance on the bottom and the back. Not only that, it's gonna be much, much safer to be able to use this to cut very small parts like you see here. Just make sure you use something to hold those small parts like this is a $10 million stick from FastCap. I'll link to it in the description. When cutting extremely small parts like that, it can be very dangerous to use a miter saw to cut those because there's no support on the back of those on most of your miter saw fences. But when you build something like this little miter saw sled, it gives you extreme support on the bottom as well as most importantly on the back so it doesn't twist and pull back into the saw and cause a kickback and or an injury. Now, if you primarily only do 90 degree cuts and don't worry about the 45s, then don't even do those and notch out your fence back there. You won't even have to use this uh, secondary fence down below. Just make sure you set the depth setting on your saw blade so that it doesn't cut all the way through this because if you do, then you've got two pieces and it's no good. Number five way to improve your miter saw is to build a proper miter saw station if you're in a dedicated shop. I built this one last year, but there are tons of options out there for you if you want to get some ideas of what works best for you. But this has really, really helped as far as the accuracy goes in my cuts. Because I was able to incorporate a stop block system in this, which I never had, I can get repeatable accurate cuts now. And it helps with organization in the shop. Not really to do with the miter saw, but it's just kind of a two birds, one stone scenario. It's your classic two bird, one stone scenario. <laughs> now you got a place for your miter saw. You can have stop blocks and you have organization and a place to keep like dust collection or dust extractors. It just really helps upgrade your shop. When I was looking for a miter saw station to build, I had to design my own because I was in a, such a small space. I wanted something compact. This is only six feet long, about two feet deep. So it takes up very minimal room. That's what I love about this one particularly. Because this miter station is so compact, I needed a way to break down longer stock whenever I bring it in the shop. So I did incorporate this wing that flips up when I need it, down and out of the way when I don't. I did a little research and in 2021 alone, there were more than 1.8 million people in the US who had to go seek emergency medical attention for upper extremity injuries, arms, fingers, hands, things like that, just in home workshops. 1.8 million, that is a lot of people. And we wanna to try to prevent that with some of these. Number one on the list is cutting small parts at the miter saw. If you've ever tried to cut a small piece, like just needed to cut a little piece off of this at the miter saw, and it feels uneasy because that's your sixth sense saying, hey dummy, don't do this. When you have a small piece though, there's nothing supporting it back here. So it's pulling this direction. That's what happened to me on a small cross build that I was making. I was trying to cut a tiny piece and it pulled just enough that it kicked back up into the blade. I didn't get it into the, into the blade, but I did break that finger. It hurt for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now, if I need to cut this and I just wanna shave a little bit off, they make this product. This is called the Million Dollar Stick and it's from FastCap. The way it works is there's two rubber pieces here that help grip and then the back also has those rubber pieces on it too. Nice rubber grip handle. For one, your hand is way away from the blade. It's gonna allow you to put pressure down back here so that you're holding pressure on the piece you're cutting and you have pressure back here. So you got three points of pressure that you're able to hold this securely. Now, because of my past experience, there's no way I'm trying to cut that without some type of hold there. So we'll cut it with this and we'll see how well it works. This is about as small as you're gonna get. I got about maybe an inch and a half of surface that's contacting the fence. So we're gonna be cutting a very tiny part here. Now there's a limit to how short of a piece you would want to cut on a miter saw. And it's gonna depend on how far or how close to the uh, cut area that your fence goes. On mine though, the fence is quite a bit of ways away from where the cut area is. So when you start cutting shorter pieces that don't have enough surface area to be supported by the back fence, you're going to run into some major problems just as you see here. I cut this down as short as I could in small bites until I finally got it to actually catch. I did that because my hand was far enough away from the blade and that the piece would be flying back that way. So I wasn't really concerned with 
it actually injuring me using something like this. But as you saw on the previous cuts, you can cut shorter stock with this. Now, a quick and easy way to add enough support so that you can cut those smaller pieces is just to add a temporary fence on there. This is just MDF. You can use plywood or anything else. Just take some double stick tape. Now your fence likely also has holes in it so that you can attach these permanently if you wanted to. And that's the piece from earlier. Now I have a sacrificial fence that's gonna give me support all the way up to the cut. That way there's nothing getting pushed back or tilting or moving at the point of the cut, which is what's gonna cause the kickback or the fault in the cut. You can cut some pretty short pieces at this point. Just be really careful and don't cut your support stick. Now, no way in any normal circumstance uh, other than this method would you wanna cut pieces this short. I would highly recommend picking up one of these. They're very inexpensive and they could save your fingers. Also with the sacrificial fence, you're basically eliminating any kind of tear out that you may have had. So it kind of plays a double role. Number two on the list is cutting panels on the saw. A lot of times are wider panels like sheet goods, things like that. Now there's a way to push these through the blade that's not going to cause it to kick back or get bound up, things like that. A lot of people think that you should be pushing over here next to the fence, you're way away from the blade, right? So that seems safest. When you do that and you're pushing on this corner, as you can see, it makes sense once you look at it that it's gonna push away from the fence, it's turning into the blade, it's gonna climb up on that blade and that blade is gonna kick it back every time, especially if you don't have a splitter, riving knife, something like that. I cut a lot of panels like this and, and have never had any issues. I do keep pressure going down on the fence, but I also push from this area this way. I kind of push force toward the fence and down at the same time, but you keep your hands way away from that blade. So you can easily make this cut safely if you just don't push on this corner. You're pushing more over here. Again, just watch where the blade's at. Keep your hand way away from it. The use of a push block here would absolutely be a good idea. Just in case something does happen, your hand is on the push block. If it gets pulled into the blade, then it protects those fingers and things like that. I like these gripper ones. I like this one, the micro jig gripper. I also like the gripper block. They have those nice grippy pads on the bottom. You can push on through the cut without any issue. Now 2B is when you're making a cut on the table saw, the reason you see so many people that have an out feed table on the back side of the saw is to prevent you from having that urge to reach across the blade to grab this off cut. When I had my old Delta, for instance, I didn't have an outfeed table for a long time and pieces would fall. And I did have that tendency to try to reach over and grab that drop piece. That is very dangerous. So get you an outfeed table or some type of work support back there. It doesn't even have to be a table. You can make a makeshift outfeed so that it, your pieces don't fall and you don't have that uh, urge to reach and grab those drop pieces. And then you may notice that I have a blade guard on here now. Uh, this came with a saw, I've never installed it. However, uh, being safety minded and trying to think as a wiser person, I was watching one of Stumpy Nub's videos and he talked about the blade guard being on there. And one of the reasons was if you trip and fall or trip or fall or stumble into the blade when it's spinning, that would prevent your hands from catching into it. So I'm gonna do my very best to leave this on there as much as possible. Number three on the list is the router table. Now, a lot of people don't give this tool enough respect, myself included. I had a kickback incident, about six of them in a row, a big dummy. So you can go watch that video. I'll link it in the description below. There'll be a card pop up here too. Uh, I was just using it improperly. I learned a valuable lesson that day. A few weeks ago, I made table saw jigs using the router table and I showed you how to cut these grooves in this small stock. It's just a very dangerous cut that you would not want to make on the router table by hand. So all I did was set up my stop blocks. I positioned my bit to be in the center of the cut and then I also made shallow passes. But I took some double-sided tape and put a handle on this piece that way I could route this safely without my fingers ever having come in close to the bit. And that's a common thing. The further you can keep your hands away from the bits and blades, the better off you're gonna be. It's pretty common sense, but we get in a hurry and we don't think about it and we do it anyway. I'm guilty of it too. Also made basically a crosscut sled or a sacrificial crosscut sled with this here. All you're gonna do is cut about a 10 inch square piece of plywood the size really doesn't matter. It could be 12, it could be eight. Drill a couple of small holes in there for clamping. You're gonna just glue a handle on there. It's a scrap piece. Set your fence up to be square. And then this is gonna allow you to cut grooves across narrow pieces. 
This works so perfect. I literally never felt safer using a router table with this jig in hand. I even said it in that video. I don't think I've ever felt safer using the uh, router table for something like that. That is a really good idea. Thank you, Mike. Super simple to do, and it makes it much, much safer. There's no way you'd want to try to hold that piece and go across that bit like that without something supporting it. Number four on the list is cutting sheet goods with a circular saw, or not really sheet goods, any long cuts that you're gonna be making. This can be dangerous if you don't do it correctly. A lot of people will make this cut and then just catch this supportive piece with their hand, their off hand that's not on the tool. Well, what happens is you put your hand in the line of that blade a lot of times. And you know on long cuts, if this isn't supported, what's going to happen usually is it's going to start binding up close to the end of the cut. When that happens, you're begging for a kickback on a circular saw. If that kicks back while your hands are underneath there, that blade is right in line with those fingers. Like this is one of the most dangerous things you can do with a circular saw like this. A, make sure that the blade depth is set correctly. Don't have it all the way down. Just barely enough to make the cut is all you need. That way, if it does happen to kick back and your hand does happen to be in the way, hopefully it does minimal damage. If it's all the way down like this one is and it kicks back, what's going to happen? Probably going to have a bad, bad day in the shop. Typically, I put it up on this table and use some bench cookies just to hold it off there and have it supported on all sides. Or if it's too big, I will set up some sawhorses out here that's going to catch this piece and not let it fall more than just a quarter inch or so. That way everything's supported. Another thing to consider is hold downs or clamping when you're using these sheet goods. Make sure you have something holding your sheet good in place. That way it's not twisting and moving on you when you try to cut it. Number five on the list is the brad nailer. I use this a ton in the shop, especially just to tack things on while the glue dries. It's one of the handiest tools you can get in the shop. Now there's a right and a wrong way to drive the nails. You do it the wrong way, it's gonna pop out the side. You do it the right way, and it won't, but you still don't wanna put your finger there. So a lot of times when you get in a hurry, it's, you'll be trying to hold a piece and then drive that nail like that. You'll wind up putting a finger there. Obviously this won't cut the finger off, but it's not gonna be a fun day in the shop. So I'm driving a nail into this piece down into that piece. I wanna make sure that the nail gun is perpendicular to the stock I'm driving into. In other words, we're making a T here, right? Drive that in there. Should drive all the way through without it popping out. Now, if you turn it the same direction as the board, a lot of times when you drive, it'll come out the side one way or the other, especially if you have any little tilt to it at all. It won't happen every time, but a lot of times it will pop out the side. Now, if your finger happened to be there, that is a long way for that nail to go into that thumb. Woo! Now, the reason it does that is if you hold it this way and the nail bends, it's gonna bend left and right because these are basically flat. So they're gonna go left or right, and different hardwoods will make it react different ways too. If it hits a knot hole in pine, it, it'll kick every time. But if you drive them this way, if they do bend, they're gonna bend with the wood you're driving into. If you drive them this way though, they can bend left or right and come out the side. One, it's gonna mess your project up and it's gonna have you a bad day if it gets in. A little more shiny, uh, a little more presentable, probably, but why? When it's cutting and it's sharp and it's doing what I need it to do, it's easy to use. I don't know what else to say. This thing's awesome. I'm gonna show you a jig that can joint boards. It can also do tapering, a high fence, clamping capabilities, and much more. And it's easy to build. Let's go. All you need to build this awesome jig is a scrap piece of three quarter inch plywood, two of these micro jig clamps, and a dovetail bit. Theirs, it works well, but any 14 degree dovetail bit will work. I'm gonna make this one four foot long. You can make it as long or as short as you want, but about three to four feet is best, depending on the length of board you typically joint or taper. First thing we're gonna do is set our table saw up to rip a piece of scrap plywood 10 inches. You just need a 10 inch wide piece. That's all you need, about three foot long. The main thing here is that you get a piece of straight plywood. In other words, it's not bent, bowed, or anything like that. I'm using three quarter inch sanded birch. You can use whatever kind you got as long as it's about three quarters of an inch thick. And we've got our plywood cut to size. I've made mine 10 inches by four feet long. Now the next thing we're gonna do is install a dovetail bit. This bit comes from Microjig. 
and it works with their dovetail clamps and I use that on a ton of things in the shop. I'm gonna set this up at 3 8 inch deep cut because that's how deep you need to cut these. And then I'm gonna set the edge guide two inches from the center of the bit. If you don't have an edge guide, you can simply use a scrap piece of plywood to set up an edge guide so that this bit will run two inches from the edge of the board. You can double stick tape this, you can clamp it, however you need to do it. All right, we cut those two long grooves. Now all we have to do is divide this up to cut our cross grooves. You're gonna measure off the end four inches on both ends. These don't have to be precise. You're not building a clock, you're building a jointing jig. So if it's close, it's fine. You're also gonna to wanna to make a mark right in the center. And for us, it's gonna be two feet or 24 inches. And then you'll also want to divide that in half again and make a mark at one foot and three feet. That's gonna be our grooves. We're gonna have one, two, three, four, five grooves going across. This is a frame and square fence. You can put it on any frame and square and it basically takes it, makes it a giant speed square so you can do stuff just like this and just use it as a straight edge or right angle guide. That's what I'm gonna do. Next thing I'm gonna do is just mark one inch from each corner and then we're gonna cut these at a 45 degree angle. And basically just give this a little dog ear on each corner just to knock those sharp edges off. You don't have to do this. If you just wanna sand that around, you can, or just leave it like it is. And again, you're not building a clock, just get it close, it'll look fine. From there, I just take some sandpaper. You can use 120 grit or whatever you want. Just kinda, just knock the rough edges or any of those little splinters you may see in there because it's plywood. Just kinda smooth that up. It doesn't take much at all. Next thing you're gonna do is take out that dovetail bit and put in a chamfer and or roundover bit if you want to kinda soften these edges up. If not, you can just take sandpaper and hit the edge of that right there just to knock that sharp edge off. But only do three sides. You're gonna do the two short sides and one long side. One long side, you're gonna leave at a sharp 90 degree angle for a purpose. Now take your sander, 120 grit's fine here. You're gonna sand the whole thing, front, back, upside down, everything. Then the next thing you wanna do is throw on some type of wax or my preference, Outlaws board butter. Throw that on the bottom of it, especially on the bottom. That's gonna help it slide on your table saw much easier. You can also put it on the top just to give it a little extra protection. We have our jig. Now we can joint boards, we can taper boards if you're making tapered legs, things like that. And we can use it as a high fence. The way this works is you're just gonna lay the board that you're gonna to want to joint. We're gonna do jointing first. Lay that right up there. First slide on your micro jig dovetail clamps. Lay the board that you are jointing on top and then just clamp it down, super simple. Now I can joint this board. I can joint boards probably, I would guess up to six feet because on the other, the smaller, the three foot one, I can joint them up to about five feet easily. About a foot off of each end and you should be able to push it through your saw safely and easily. Once everything's clamped down, you just, you're gonna put the square edge against your blade the chamfered edge will go against the fence. This is a perfect tapering jig because all you have to do is line up the mark. In other words, the width on each end. If the top of my taper was two inches wide and the bottom was one inch wide, all I do is line up both of those marks on the edge here and then just run it through. And you can repeat this over and over and over. You can even make stops to go in these little grooves using the other hardware they have, make it easier to make repeatable cuts. Another thing that's extremely useful about this is now you can have a high fence that'll clamp onto any existing fence. What that's awesome for is if you have to make grooves in the ends of plywood or other panels or raised panels if you wanted to angle that blade and you could use this as extra support vertically. This is perfect for that. It's super strong, it doesn't bend or flex and it clamps to any fence you got. As you can see, this jig will work perfectly fine on a job site saw, a cabinet saw, anything you got. One thing you could do if you wanted to make this super accurate, in other words, not really rely on the fence at all, is put a miter bar or a piece of wood that goes on the uh, inside the miter slot. You could do that if you didn't want to fool the fence. I found that I like using the fence just as a guide because it makes it fast, simple, and you don't have to worry about trying to get that miter slot lined up or anything like that. 
On thinner pieces, you'll want to make sure that your clamp is not gonna contact that blade because it can get over that far if you're not careful. Just keep an eye on that, you'll be fine. If you joint shorter boards or you have a job site saw, this four foot version will work on the job site saw. It's really not that unwieldy back here. Just this is easier to handle if you got a, a smaller saw just because of the bed is smaller. You saw how that tips like that. The, the shorter one's not gonna do that as much. So if you have a smaller saw and you don't normally joint long boards, I would really recommend the three footer. And if you're making the three footer, it's the exact same way to make the four footer. You're gonna measure off four inches off each end. Then you'll measure right in the center and then split the center from the four inch. So, so basically you're just gonna divide it in half and then divide it in half again. One other awesome thing you can do with this jig we just built is now we have a way to clamp things to our table. If you got a couple of quick clamps, clamp this to the table. Now we have a way to clamp things up here like this. If we needed to work on this piece of plywood or route into a groove like we did this, and you don't have T-tracks, this is an excellent, excellent way to do it. This micro jig match fit system is so versatile. I bought this myself and I've enjoyed having it in the shop. I've used it on a ton of projects. I've used it in my previous workbench where I got now got the CNC, but before I was able to clamp things down before I had T-Tracks. And I used it on my crosscut sled and the mobile workbench that I built previously that has a bunch of different clamping options. All right, we're back with Mr. Steve Julian here at Woodcraft, and he's gonna give us the do's and don'ts on power equipment in the wood shop, and especially those that he sees most often from beginners, because he works with a bunch of beginners. Yes, before we use any machines in the class, we go over safety, and safety is paramount. We're talking about operating the table saw. Now, first things first, you have to have the right blade installed on the saw to do the particular task that you're about to do. When we're in a ripping kind of scenario, we want to use a blade that has a low tooth count. Okay, in this case, 24 teeth, 18 teeth, 30 teeth is probably the maximum on rip. When we're cross cutting a board, which means that we're cutting a board across the grain, we need a blade with a higher tooth count. So this particular case, we'll use an 80 tooth. The gullets on the, the space between the two teeth is considerably smaller than the ripping blade is. And the reason for that is that this blade doesn't have uh, as much work to do as this blade does since we're cutting across the grain. It only takes a couple of minutes yeah. to change your blades, so you, you really don't want to use when you, something. When you said a couple of minutes, that made me think a lot of times, especially me, you get in a hurry, your mind's on the project, and you don't take that extra two minutes to take the blade right. out, and that causes issues because you know, it, you're getting in a hurry, and then it you're, does, you're, it does cause, you're not, you don't have your mind on the task. Yes, sir, it does cause issues, so put the appropriate blade on and you'll be fine. Yeah. The rest of it is all about your physical safety. You must be in control. As soon as that board hits the top of the table and you're about to cut it, you must be in control before, during, and after the cut. Never let go of the board. Mm -hmm. That is the reason we use a variety of sacrificial push sticks because we never want to be using our hands as push sticks. So we use these devices to keep us safe. If we're about to rip a board, it's okay to start. I always have the push stick there at the ready right? before I do anything. So you're pushing the wood with both hands. You're staying away from this red area right here. That's why it's red. You're staying away from that. No hands around here. The blade guard is in place. The splitter is in place, and the splitter is probably the most important thing you can be using on your table saw, the splitter or the riving knife, mm -hmm. either, either one work. The reason this is so important is because of internal stress on the boards. Internal stress is probably the number one reason of kickback. Mm -hmm. If it closes back up on itself after the cut is made, the teeth that are coming out of the table saw from beneath are not your friend. Mm -hmm. These teeth that are coming this way will catch that pinched board and will throw that thing back with violent speed towards you. And it may take your hand with it. First of all, the board is gonna be lifted up off the surface of the table. The second thing that's gonna happen is these teeth coming from out of the table are gonna catch that board and it's going to push the board in this 
direction. Always right to left. So if your hand is here, you're holding it, a kickback does occur, the board's going to go this way and it's liable to take your hand with it. So your hand is coming across the blade mm. too. That's why it's so important to have this device or something similar right. to it in place before we do that. So we can go ahead and push boards through until you start to see metal. That's once, a good tip. once you start to see metal, you reach for this. This will finish up you. Your left hand will drop away. Now you can finish the cut safely, push it this way. When you're pushing with a device like this, it, you want to have the thing skewed. It needs to be tilted towards the fence and you need to be putting downward pressure on it at the same time. So we're, we're moving it this way against the fence and we're moving it across the blade. So this device has this little cleat back here which it will catch the end of the board as your left hand drops away. Now you're still totally in control and you can safely push this thing even if the fence is closer mm -hmm. to the blade, okay? You can still, your hand is obviously not gonna fit here. A push pad like this is obviously not gonna fit in there. So use something that's thinner that you can get a hold of and push all the way through. You have to push all the way through. Another common mistake I see when we're dealing with boards that are four, five, six feet long, the number one thing I see is they tilt the board down. For some reason, mm -hmm. they just, with their right hand, they just, they want to tilt the board down. So it's not do, laying flat. Right, do not tilt the board down, okay? We need, once it's in contact, it remains in contact until the cut is complete. So that's another important thing to remember. So whether it be a sheet of plywood or a board or whatever, you need to be in control. Mm -hmm. Say I have a four foot piece of plywood and I'm cutting, okay, it's okay to do that. But what I'm doing when I'm cutting plywood, I'm not looking at the blade, I'm not looking at the fence. I'm looking at the relationship between the upper edge of the board that I'm, that I'm cutting and the fence. Mm. I'm always looking in this direction over here as I'm pushing through because I wanna make sure it's a consistent contact here all the way through the board. So I'm looking pretty much in a diagonal kind of direction when I'm ripping a board like that. Whether it be plywood or solid wood, you don't wanna drift away from the fence. You always wanna make solid contact with the fence itself all the way through the board. Yeah. All right, so you see a lot of mistakes on the jointer or potential mistakes. Hopefully you're catching it before it happens. But this is a, a sneaky, dangerous machine. It is. Because you, you kind of feel a little better. There's not a spinning blade right in front of your face, but it's underneath this guard here. Yes. And that's, that's the dangerous part. So what do you yes. see most often here? Okay, first thing we have to ensure that it is the, is the cover operating correctly. We need to make sure the relationship between the, the fence and the bed of the joiner are at a, at a 90 degree angle. We have to make sure that the depth of cut is set correctly, that we're not trying to take too much off. The most important thing when we are flattening one face of the board that we use our safety devices. So we want the board underneath both of these. We always want to use both hands. Mm -hmm. We need to have this firm pressure and be walking the board all the way across until it exits the other side. Always using push sticks of push pads, push sticks, or whatever. Now, when we're joining the edge, when, it's, when the board is upright, well, these can be used this way as you're pushing the board across. They can be used with a, another type of push stick. Also, you can use a, a magnetic feather board. So since this mag switch kind of setup is appropriate for this kind of thing, that it becomes tilted sometimes. Well, if, you, if it becomes tilted... <laughs> you just defeated the purpose. You defeated the purpose of the thing. That's why the use of a magnetic featherboard or some sort of a featherboard here that's attached to the bed mm -hmm. is really useful. We don't really need to be concerned over here. This is the business end of the fence. So if we can keep this straight all the way across the cut, I feel that this is more important over here and keeping, it's keeping your hands further away from the blade and uh, using a, maybe a thinner push stick on top of the board. This will help you hold it against the fence. 
This will help you on the downward pressure mm -hmm. and you can just comfortably move this thing along. Nice. Let's talk about the router table for a few minutes. I've had minutes. my fair share of issues at the router table. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> you have. So the router table is uh, one of the nicest things you can have. It's so much nicer to bring the work to the router than the other way around. Mm -hmm. The way this one is set up, we have the Jessam lift. All the controls are on top, the height adjustment control, the locking mechanism control, that's all controlled from up here. The only thing it's not controlled from up top is the variable speed. The number one thing you need to be looking for when you purchase a router, variable speed is critical. The reason it's so critical is because the diameter of the bits. Mm -hmm. We're not all using the same diameter bit. You must be in control of the speed. Okay, so the bigger the bit, the slower the RPMs. The smaller the bit, the higher the RPMs. So they're inversely proportional to one another. You don't want to be spinning a raised panel bit that's two and a half inches in diameter at 24,000 RPMs. That's nuts. If that size diameter bit run at 24,000 RPMs, you're looking at about 240 miles an hour at the tip of the bit. Mm. When you're using a larger diameter bit, slow the speed as far low as it will go. This prevents any, any mishaps. It prevents uh, the router getting out of control because you want to be in control. Another important point is light passes on the router table. Small bites like we Small talked about earlier. Small bites. Okay, so now what I want to demonstrate is to uh, how to joint one surface square. I'm going to be using my mag switch and I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lock in the back portion with the magnet and then I'm going to tilt this thing forward and lock in the front one. Okay, so that's going to keep me in a pretty pretty steady vertical position. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn the joiner on, I'm going to start pushing the board through with my hands and then when I come to the end of it, I'm going to grab the push stick and finish the cut. Okay, we have the joiner set to the correct depth. You can tell by the gauge here, it's um, about an eighth of an inch. So we're going to get started. So I'm going to start back here. I'm going to engage the featherboard. I'm going to work my way through it. Keep moving forward. Then I'm going to grab my stick all the way through. There we have it. Clean, smooth. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten a face. What I usually like to do is sight down the board and see which way it's shifting. In this particular case, it looks like it's, it's moving towards the right. So what I want to do, whenever you're doing stuff like this, you always want to sight down the board and you always want to have the frown down. That applies to the joiner that applies to the table saw. You always want the curvature, if there is curvature in it, to be on the table surface. If I did it this way, now I have a smiley face up. We've got a stability problem because the thing is going to rock, okay, because it's going to be low on this end, high on both of these. So it's going to rock. That's the reason we always put the frown down, okay? Another important thing is consistency in sound. The sound must be consistent all the way through the cut. If it's not, you're not cutting any wood. One of the tips that I use is to take a piece of chalk and put a squiggle line all the way down the board with chalk. That'll tell you that once the chalk is gone, you're done. It's flat. Yeah. So it's almost like sanding when you put the lines on the When sand. you put the squiggly lines on sanding, it's, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. It can go through either way. Why? Because we're not relying on the fence anymore. We're only relying on the table bed. So there's the frown is going down and we'll flatten that face. So again, I'm putting consistent pressure down and I'm moving forward. Okay, so now what we have is a board that has a 90 degree edge on it. I'm checking it in a few spots, I'm looking for daylight and I don't see any. So just run the square down all the way so you can see that it comes out perfectly square. 
that is our starting point right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, we deal with this later on when we go to the table saw to make our final width cut and that will remove this and that's how we do it. If you enjoyed this video and you've watched this long, check out that compilation video of more tips and tricks. Click in the box, get you the big old virtual fist bump. Thank you.